Uh, happy Tuesday, everybody. Uh, Patrick from Half Keto Worldview. Eight questions with. Um, it's a beautiful night here in southeastern Michigan, southeastern Michigan, 71 degrees, bright and sunny. Uh, we, our guest is Michael Goldberg. Um, so, yeah, there's been a couple of people I've had on this show that have just been like, holy crow. Um, and Michael Goldberg was definitely one of those. Uh, he is a heavy hitter. Um, his accomplishments, I could talk about his accomplishments probably for a good all the show itself uh, without even talking to him. I could tell you what he's done in his career. Um, while we're here to talk about his latest book that came out on June 1st, uh, The Life, uh, Wicked Game, The Life of Guitarist James. Uh, uh, I always get this wrong. James Calvin Wilsey. Uh, we're going to have a talk about a whole bunch of things because his background is mind blowing. Uh, he wrote for Rolling Stone for 10 years. Um, he, he's actually, when he was, when he was a youngster, he actually bought the first issue of, of the Rolling, of Rolling Stone and decided to become a music journalist right then and there. Uh, he started his own zine. Uh, with his friend, who, uh, and, and he uh, worked with the Grateful Dead. He's worked with bands like such as Flaming Groovies. Uh, it's just, where do you even go with this, right? I mean, he's just done so much in his career. I mean, it's incredible what he's done. Um, he's been named on um, several lists because back in the 90s, uh, he, he knew what the what, how uh, the music field was going to change uh, digitally, and he was on the, on the uh, cutting edge of that. Uh, Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't even know what to say. Uh, you know, I'm just like, wow, I just blown away. Uh, he and I came from the same area. He worked in San Francisco. Uh, he was a, he was a, a writer and later senior editor for the Western for the uh, on the West Coast for the uh, for the Rolling Stone. He's also wrote several cover articles on Rolling Stone. Think about that for a second. A major uh, music magazine and writing a cover story for it. That doesn't happen a lot. I mean, even look at magazines today or what have you, cover stories are rare animals indeed. And when you think about the scope that Rolling Stone had, I'm not so sure they have it now, but back then, getting a cover was just absolutely crazy, uh, a, a, a huge success. Um, he is also a animal activist. So we already know we got music right there. We got animal activists, uh, covered, uh, his book is called, uh, like I said, wicked game. Um, the story of guitarist, uh, James Calvin Wilsey. Uh, he was a founding member of the Avengers. In my opinion, I am curious to see what Michael thinks, but in my opinion, the most important American punk rock band. Uh, that's just my opinion. I mean, I know a lot of people think Ramones or Flesh Eaters or, or Germs or what have you, but for me, um, so uh, so we and we'll be talking about that. Um, James uh, James Cowell Wilsey or James Wilsey, he was a very good guitarist, and he played for Chris Isaac for ten years. And he helped write and made the song Wicked Game, which is probably Chris Isaac's most famous song. I can grant you that. Uh, he is, uh, uh, he has, he helped write that song, helped make it, make it famous. Number two, you know, as far as Chris Isaac goes, is his number one hit. It reached number two on the Billboard charts. Uh, but according to what what we're going to talk about with with Michael is. It was a little bit too much success, uh, a common story for far too many of our uh, musician artists um, to get to that certain fame. And then it, they can't, you know, it gets pressure, it gets built up. All sorts of variety of things happen. A lot of them go to drugs. And um, that's what happened to James. He battled addiction for 30 years, 31 years before he passed away from organ failure at age 61. 61 he passed away so uh but um we're gonna be talking about the book and what what, what you know why he wrote it what went into it who he talked to but obviously we're gonna talk about a whole bunch of things here a whole bunch of things uh i can't wait um i'm really honored 
to have him here tonight. Uh, this is the type of this is the type of guest that I book because this is this is why I do this. This is exactly why I do this, and I'm sure Michael will probably agree with that. You know, when he when he interviews certain artists, he sets down a you know facing them. This is why he got into music journalism to actually sit down and do a one on one and talk with the artist. Not so much ask questions, just talk, which is what I try to do here. I I don't have any preset questions really. You know, you guys know that guys who are already been here. Uh, you know, I don't have a whole set of questions that I read off to the guests. I, I just, I get in, I get a feel for it, and then we start talking, and we just go and go and go. Um, I have a feeling, I hope, I'm praying that Michael really enjoys the experience today because I don't think I'm going to be able to get everything in on one interview. Uh, hopefully, he'll come back and do this again with us. I'm already doing, I'm already planning this, even before I talk to him. So, um uh, I'm glad you guys are here tonight. Uh, those who are here, um, thank you for that. Uh, I, you know, I'm totally. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys are gonna really, really enjoy this uh, as much as I am. Uh, if some of you know that I do uh, talk, to, uh, hey CV. Yeah, let's put it this way: Who is your favorite baseball player, CV? If you could, if you could talk to one baseball player, who would you like to interview? And then transfer that to this show tonight, because Michael Goldberg, Michael Goldberg would definitely be, uh, uh, definitely make the bucket list for one of the people I would love to talk to. So the chance that I actually get to do this is extremely exciting for me. Joe DiMaggio. So now imagine that's how I feel right now. If I actually had a chance to sit down and talk to Joe DiMaggio. So uh, you needless to say, you can see how happy I am. And good player too. I would love to talk to Joel and Joe. He's one of my favorite Yankee ball players. Uh, Okay, uh, uh, Michael will be here in about eight minutes, so I got a little bit of time to do the calendar, uh, and we will do that, uh, definitely. Mm. Uh, what's really interesting about this is that me and Michael do have a slight connection we have the six degrees of separation thing going on we have that in this interview because he knows chris isaac he knows penelope houston and i worked with chris isaac and i worked with penelope houston um so this is going to be a, a, a really uh it's going to be fun let's see All right, calendar time. So uh, tonight, like I said, Michael Goldberg's here. Tomorrow, our good friend Sean Kane will be here, uh, film director extraordinaire, uh, an excellent editor, in-demand editor. I, I, it's crazy how busy he is. Uh, he is, um, I, I, you know, I'm actually surprised more directors don't do what Sean does, uh, you know, when they're not directing a movie, that they just slide over and become an editor. Because if I'm a, if I'm a director and I'm gonna go I'm gonna give my film to an editor, yeah, I can give it to a straight editor, but to give it to a guy who also have a, a girl or girl or guy, to give them a movie to one of those who already is a film director and an editor, that's just you know that's gonna make my movie even pop more because you have an idea, you know you have an idea what I'm trying to do. You can see partly my vision maybe not all of it but most of it or and you can collaborate with me or as a straight editor a lot of times it's just the editor it's just like okay this is how i see in it the director will be there with you to walk you through what he thinks it is but you know there's but he doesn't have that directing eye you know he he he, he knows what the, he can follow what the director wants 
but he can't see through the director's eye. And Sean King can. And I think that's what makes him really special besides being, a, like I said, a, he's a really good film director. Um, he makes some fun movies. Um, he, he he actually, he's the reason I got into this whole, whole kit and the caboodle when I started writing mo uh, movie reviews and whatnot. Yeah, he's the one that got me going. Uh, I, my very first movie I, I ever reviewed. Um, uh, oh, he begs for a movie deal? Yeah, that's probably not a good way to do it. I mean, you know, um, oh, uh, unless he's a unless he's an executive producer and he's trying to do the pitch, you know, like uh, you know, like meeting with financiers and whatnot. Um, uh, that's tough. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. If you're yeah, if you're punching above your weight, you're not going to hit. Not in that business. No, no. You got to start small. You got to start small. You got to, you know, you got to, I mean, yeah, it's, and anything you do, you got to start small and build your way up. You know, you got to, hey, Echo, um, have you, uh, if you're a music fan, Echo, you came to the right show tonight. That's all I got to say. If you, if you like music, this is the show for you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to have ambition. I mean, I see that all the time. I see a lot of time in in casting uh, groups on Facebook. I see people all the time walk in there and go like, I want to be an actor. How do I do it? And it's like, well, it's not as easy as walking in there and, you know, just, you know, like, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I want to be an actor. What, who do I call? It's like, <laughs> it's not that easy. You know, you have to go take classes. Uh, you have to gain some experience, you know, shoot three or four short films, do some live theater. Um, uh, uh, you know, get get seasoned. You know, uh, you know, you know, gain some experience. Work on a crew. Work on an independent movie. There's a, there's a. It's it's very rare that you know, as far as you know, unless you are, unless you have, unless you're grown up in a famous family, of course. But I'm talking about you know Joe Blow from uh, Idaho. Uh, there's he has a lot of work to do. Uh, it's just not going to walk up there and you know, I, I'm a director. I, I want to make a movie. Oh, okay, you know, I want you to, I want you to finance my movie. I'm a director. Okay, what have you done? Well, I haven't done anything yet. How are you a director, and how are you making a movie? Uh, you got to do that. Screenwriting is a very good thing to do. I highly recommend that. It's a good path to take. Um, and he can go ahead and he can write a screenplay, and then he should look down for any all all the local. Uh, uh, all the local uh, uh, indie film filmmakers around and get together with, with some of them or, or join a writer's group, a writer's room where they can switch off their, you know, they can read your screenplay, they, they can read his, and then they give you ideas. They, you know, they write notes on it. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it to improve your craft. Uh, the best thing you'd want to try to do is to get a movie made, uh, you know, go with somebody who, who is wants to be a director and he wants to, you know, he wants to make a movie and you got a script, we'll collaborate. Um, but as far as going up to the big, you know, I'm going to call George Lucas up and ask him to look at my first script that I wrote. Yeah, that's never going to happen. <laughs> Not, it's never that easy. But that's good, though. Yeah, see, he's trying. He just, you know, you just got to work harder, work smarter, not harder. And uh, screenplay and joining a writer's group, you can go to a community college. Or community theater, a black box theater, uh, or anywhere where there's anywhere you know, uh, independent film companies, you know, look, you know, like join some Facebook groups, uh, screenwriting groups. Um, you know, after a while, you'll know the, the the you'll know the true people other than the people who are wannabes. Uh, you'll gain experience along that line as well. So uh, there's a lot of things you could do to to advance your career. Uh, but he, he, yeah, but start small because you'll, if you start small, you'll see more accomplishments early on. You know, you'll, things will happen a lot faster when you're, when you first start out, uh, it, you know, you can get a person to do a short film for, you can write a script, uh, you can make it happen. You know, you can write a script and, you know, act it out in the park, you know, grab some actors, you know, uh, find a theater, have some actors in it and go out there and do table reads. You know, um, there's a lot of things you could do. So, yeah, but you're right. He's trying. So that's that's good. 
Uh, if you're here, I see we got five people. Come on in. I appreciate if you come on and say hi. Uh, please hit the like button. And if you're new to the channel, uh, please consider uh, giving us a sub and leaving a comment. Uh, our guest, Michael Goldberg, will be here um, any minute now. Uh, make sure he didn't send me a note here. Nope. Oh. Uh, so uh, on the calendar, on the calendar, because I got to do that, right? Uh, so the calendar is here, and uh, so so Sean's gonna be here tomorrow on June 9th, Thursday. Our friend, actor, and uh, singer Jerry Jerry L. Beasley will be here. Uh, this will be my first time I interview Jerry on this format, but not the first time I've interviewed Jerry. Uh, Jerry is hey Star Lord, hope you're feeling better. All right, guys, let's put it together. All right, uh, this is this is gonna be a lot of fun. I'm glad you guys are here for this. This is gonna be one of those shows that when you when you talk about it later on, you saw this here. So, all right, let's go get him. Michael Goldberg. Greetings, sir. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you know what? Let me let's 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 get this right right off the bat. Thank you for letting me have you because. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely the one sitting in the in the catbird seat, and I can't believe I'm talking to you. Um, wow, what a what a career! What a, what an amazing career you have had. I, I I'm just like you know, I was doing my research, poking around, and I'm just like, why why is he talking to me? Because <laughs> it's like it's like why isn't he talking like you know like those big magazines? Because this guy is like famous. He's rock star. You're rock star famous. You know, I'm. I don't. Um, I'm happy to talk to um, to anyone who's interested in hearing. You know, in this case, hearing about this book and about Jimmy Wilsey and you know, kind of what I've been working on and and all. And uh, you know, I mean, it's like it's just you know, it's just great to, that you're interested. And I never take it for granted that people are going to be interested in anything. You know, actually, I mean, uh, I mentioned before you got here on the pre-show, I says, you know, we had a, that little Kevin Bacon uh, six degrees of separation going in. You know, and that's actually one of the questions I asked, too. I think maybe that was the question I think that got you that, that you realized that I was very interested in it. But uh, I wanted to make sure that Penelope was good, good with it because I had worked with Penelope on three shows. And uh, I, I enjoy her very, very much. She's like one of the top five artists that I booked in my career. Um, and uh, and Chris Isaac. And I did a couple of shows with Chris and um, had dinner with him and his band. Probably, if I'm not mistaken, it might have even been with uh, uh, Jimmy, now that I think about it. When was it? It would have been uh, with 92. Um, it's possible. I mean, if was it were they touring? I think they were. The, the, uh, they weren't. I uh, see. I was. I I actually worked in San Jose. So okay. I worked. Remember you remember the uh, remember the Edge? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Edge in Palo Alto. That's where I was. Well, it, he might have been there. I mean, yeah. that's you know, ninety two was when he um, parted ways. Um, actually, I mean Isaac fired him. Uh, but yeah. So, but it could have been before then. Yeah, right, right, then or real thin. I mean, because I know the Chris used to do was, uh, as you know, this that before he went on tour, he would play a handful of club dates or locally, you know, the oh, fine yeah. and everything else. So that's what he did. He came down and played a cup. He played for, for us. He played for at Slims, and then you know some club dates, and then he went on national tour. And um, you know that was always fun. And he's he was always a perfect gentleman too. Very nice man. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, and you know, like I said, I, I, but I didn't get the, I didn't get the book Penelope when the Avengers. I got the book her when her solo days, where she's putting yeah. up all the, all the acoustic albums. Yeah, well, she, made, she's made a, just great albums. She's, she's an excellent artist. I mean, she was great in the Avengers, and she's been, and she's, of course, she still has the Avengers going, but, um, 
she's she's i mean and she's also a great visual artist she's an incredible painter yeah i i've been trying i i'm not real hard because i mean i just because you know it's like i'm trying i love i love to sit down and talk to her i love to sit down and talk to her because she, she's just an amazing human being and i i don't know about you i'm just going to ask you right now is it safe to say if you were going to do your top five most important not favorite but most important american rock american punk rock bands the avengers have to be top five am i right um i think the avengers are certainly i mean are certainly one of the great um you know punk bands you know of in the world and um I mean, when they played right before the Sex Pistols at Winterland, I mean, I was I was at that show, and I'm not the only one who thinks that, you know, they were better than the Sex Pistols. Yeah, they can't. They you know, off the stage. There's there's a bunch of people who who saw that show who thought that, uh, because the Avengers cared. I mean, they cared about what they were doing, and they were every member of that band was, you know really into it and uh and greg the guitar player just a brilliant brilliant guitar player you know jimmy was a great bass player in the avengers um you know danny incredible drummer and of course you know penelope you know she wrote the lyrics she sang the songs really really strong front person um so you know they they cared i mean i don't know you know the sex pistols were about to break up you know they knew it they knew they were going to break up yeah, they they just uh yeah the, the, they just blew them off the stage. I've talked to people who've been at the show too, and they were just like, yeah, if that had been like I think one of the best way I remember is they said well, if that had been a fight, they would have stopped it at the introductions. <laughs> it's like I'm like, well, yeah, I can see that. Um, I don't think the Avengers really get you know every time I hear I see I don't think they get their fair you know fair due. Every time I hear people talk you know American punk rock, the first thing you know it's, it's such a tired trope too. They always mention well the, the the Ramones. The Ramones have their pro have their place, but were they a better band? I don't think so. I, I just don't. I just I think I think they're important in what they did, but as far as musically top to bottom, they they no, they weren't. Well, I mean, the, I I don't know if you could even compare because the Ramones basically came up with something brand new at that point. I mean, I mean. You know, you got to remember when the Ramones showed up, I mean, you know, the Doobie Brothers were happening. I mean, all this like, you know, the Beach Boy, I mean, not the Beach Boys, the, the Bee Gees and, you know, all this really slick, you know, pop and rock music was happening. And, you know, bands like Led Zeppelin and, and I mean, the Stones that were just in the stratosphere, you know, it's like nobody could, you know, you know, I mean, Jimmy Wilsey himself, you know, said like, you know, he couldn't even imagine, you know, I mean, like, like he loved Je Jeff Beck, but he couldn't even imagine, you know, being, being able to play like that, you know, and, you know, when the Ramones came along, it just changed everything. I mean, the songs were short, there were no solos, they were, the playing was, was very simple. Um, the lyrics were almost, almost like, um, you know, Morse code or something. I mean, they were like the lyrics were haikus almost. I mean, they were so um, so kind of brief and concise and and contained. Um, and so, um, you know, I mean, the Ramones triggered, in, in a sense, the Ramones triggered everything that came after that. There would have been no Sex Pistols, no Clash, none of that would have happened. You know, none of so so like the San Francisco punk scene wouldn't have even happened. Probably they wouldn't have even Penelope would have, would have continued, you know, would have pursued art, you know, at the San Francisco art Institute. Um, so, I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole different, different thing. I mean, uh, but I mean, you know, I saw the Ramones a bunch of times. I saw the Avengers. They were both great, great, great yeah. bands, you know? And the yeah. thing is, I mean, you know, you ask, you, you say, well, what are, you know, the, you know, Avengers would be in the, like the top five bands or whatever, but you know, you know, when they have like a list of the hundred best albums, I mean, I think the list should be the 10,000 best albums because I mean, it's not like there's just a, I mean, there's like, you know, 
just between the Beatles and the and Elvis and the Clash and you know Radiohead and Nirvana and you know you 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 could basically like lay out about thirty or forty bands, maybe less, and you'd have a hundred hundred great albums, and that wouldn't even begin to touch all the great albums because I mean, how do you um, I mean is is you know, are you going to say, well, OK, Computer is one of the great albums. OK, well, so is Blonde on Blonde, you know, well, so is Revolver. Well, so is, um, you know, the Avengers Pink album. Well, so is, you know, you know, the Nirvana Nevermind, you know, Nirvana's Nevermind. Well, so are like, you know, the Sleater Kinney's first six albums. I mean, I mean, it's like there's so many albums that, in my opinion, are perfect albums. So, um, you know, I mean, it's like there's a lot of really good artists, you know what I mean, that have existed over, over time. And so at least from where I sit, um, you know. I, I think some yeah. bands, I, I think some bands, though, I mean, they're, you know, they might have, you know, they have might have been first, you know, they have they, they might have been first. But a lot of those bands, I mean, they're great bands, but they're also table setters. You know, they're almost like, okay, I'm going to kick the door in and step out of the way and let, let everybody else come through. You know, you, like you've taken as far as you can. And then, and then, you know, everything gets, you know, stronger and stronger and stronger after that. I mean, because, you know, our, you know, because uh, you know, punk rock was initially what, you know, was initially, you know, the what was it safe to say because the UK was doing a, a slightly before the Ramones. Um, no, no. Wait, who are you saying? I mean, what? the UK punk, the UK uh, uh, punk side. Uh, no, punk. no, 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 no. Was it, was it the, all Ramon, the Ramones, the Ramones went to London, and in the audience were guys like Joe Strummer, and you know, you know, some of the guys that ended up in the Sex Pistols, and and other, other, you know, people who subsequently formed bands because they saw the Ramones play and they thought they thought it was great, but they also thought I can do this too. You know, I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy Wilsey saw the Patti Smith group on Saturday night live. And when he saw that, that was when he said to himself, you know, this band is great, but I could play it, play that. I could do that. You know, th that was the same thing, I mean, that the Ramones did. They made people feel like they could be up there, too, and really trigger, triggered uh, really the whole the, the punk movement in a, in a sense. I mean, in terms of the the big, big movement. I mean, there were other bands in New York at the same time yeah. as the Ramones. There was the Talking Heads. There was Patti Smith Group. There was television there, you know, and Richard Richard Hell. Mink Deville, the original, you know, Blondie when she was a lot more um, edge edgy than she, she ended up being. You know, there were, you know, there were all these bands and they were all doing really different things. Uh, but when the Ramones went to London, that just kicked off this like huge, huge thing. Was that, what was what was going on at the time in Britain? I mean, I know that their sound was. I mean, they were edging toward that. I mean, because with the mod scene and, and, you know, everybody was getting away from the Beatles and whatnot. They're they were going toward the harder rock, you know, more acidy rock. But there's got to be, I mean, there had to be, I mean, th do you think it was safe to say that they are on their own way and the Ramones came in there and just gave them a shot in the ass, go like, all right, all right. I mean, you know, like a lot of bands, a lot of bands, you know, this from, so they've seen so many. There's a lot of bands that, that play it safe. You know, they don't like necessarily unleash, you know, they, 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 they just, stay quiet they stay within themselves and sometimes it takes a, a record or it takes maybe a change or whatever it is and all of a sudden they discover you know maybe a, comp a competitor or, or a peer that you know all of a sudden they, they tweak their sound a little bit and all of a sudden that sound is just like you know what like you said i can do that i want to do the same thing they're doing but doing it better and uh, uh and I, I that's what i that's what i think that happened i think i think a lot of people saw what the Ramones were doing, and they went, not only were they saying, "I want to do that," but I want to do it better. Um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I, I'm not dissing the Ramones by any stretch. I mean, like I said, they're, they're top five. 
uh, I, I just felt to me, I mean, especially with a woman front, you know, you got to throw that into the mix too. I mean, seeing a woman up there and punk and, and punk do playing punk rock music like Penelope did again, nobody was doing that either. Well, Patty Smith was already doing it. Deborah Harry was doing it. Um, Tina uh, Weymouth was playing, was playing, um, bass in the, in the talking heads. Um, you know, uh, Deborah Harry was doing it. So, I mean, you know, it was happening already. I mean, um, so that wasn't really, that wasn't the innovative thing that, I mean, the, the Avengers were great because the songs were great. The performances were great. You know, I mean, they were, they were a incredible live band. I think they made great recordings. I mean, I think the, um, I mean, We Are The One is, is just one of the best singles or, you know, her song, you know, recorded songs, you know, it's, it's just great. It's so, such a great song and has so much power to it. Um, and, and it's, re it's really an anthem. And, you know, that was a song that, um, I mean, Jimmy Wilsey came up with the mute with most of the music and Penelope wrote the lyrics, but the lyrics kind of came out of some ideas that, that Jimmy Wilsey had. Um, but I mean, that's just a great, great recording. Um, you know, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you don't, I mean, so you don't, you know, don't, bands don't always have to be the innovator to be, no. to make, you know, incredible, you know, really incredible, great music. And, and that was the thing with the Avengers. They, they really did. And, uh, you know, they, pl they play like a hundred shows in the two years that they were together. And that's a lot of shows. It and is. You know, and they were good. They were good, you know, really from the start, pretty much. So by the time, you know, you know, some time went by, I mean, they were just, uh, I mean, you know, people who saw them, you know, loved them and still do. I mean, to this day, I mean, um, you know, people are excited when, when the current version of the Avengers goes out and tour, probably more people see the Avengers now than, in the, than, than, in, in the, than the first, you know, because in those days, meaning we're talking the late seventies, we're talking the Avengers formed in June of 77 and they broke up in the middle of 79 um, at that. And they, they never played the East coast. They only played up and down the West coast. And so subsequently, you know, not that many people, you know, relatively speaking, got to see them. Now they got to where they could pack the Mabue Gardens. They could, they could pack 400 people into that place. But, you know, 400 people isn't isn't 5,000 people at the, you know, San Francisco Civic Auditorium. And I mean, the biggest show they ever played was when they were, you know, when they went on right before the Sex Pistols. That was that was the biggest show show they ever did at that mm -hmm. at that time. Um but um yeah, I think now now there's a, there's many more Avengers fans at this point in time than in their than in their you know sort of heyday of the uh, of basically the the original band. I, it makes me feel so good to hear you say that too because you know you and I we're 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 you know we've been around for you know a long time I and mean, you've been around you know you know and I and I say this with a badge of honor you know I say yeah I've been around but I say it with a badge of honor I'm glad to've been around to see some of the things I've seen oh, yeah. you know and, and you know I wouldn't trade that for nothing uh you know like when I saw it when I was reading about to yours I was just thinking holy shit this guy's been everywhere he's seen everybody and he's talked to everybody it's just an amazing career you've had um I mean, we're going to talk about this in more in depth, but I, I want to ask this right off the bat because I'm really am curious about it. But what was your connection with uh, James? What was what was he? Were you childhood friends? Uh, were you, uh, you know, did you did you know each other? You know, when he first started out, was it was it just something you saw him play and it just moved you, or you know, I I saw the Avengers play, you know, in uh, I saw them open for the for the Sex Pistols, and I saw them uh, play at the Mabue Gardens, and I thought they were great, a great band. I took photographs of them in 1978, 
and some of those photographs are in are in this book, Wicked Game. Um, but I didn't meet Jimmy then. The first time I met him was in 1982, when I uh, was doing a story for the San Francisco Examiner about up and coming bands, rock bands in the Bay Area, and a lot of people were talking about this band Silvertone, and so I went to see them at the Berkeley Square. They were great. Afterwards, um, Eric Jacobson, who was their producer and their co-manager, uh, took me backstage to introduce me to the to the band, and that's the first time I met Jimmy. Um, and then over the next, um, basically over the the next you know nine years or so, I would periodically see Jimmy. Um, when I was, you know, I'd go see Silvertone play, and then later it was Chris Isaac and Silvertone. But I'd I'd go to shows. I'd see, I'd see the guys in the band. You know, sometimes I would do interviews, and because uh, I wrote a bunch of stories. I mean, I wrote the first story, probably the first national story about Chris Isaac, which was a, a short story in Rolling Stone right when the first album came out. And then I ra ra wrote. Um, you know, two additional stories, including one that was kind of a cover story when Wicked Game was a big hit. There were, it was like Chris was on the cover, but so were three other artists. It was like a, you know, these are, these are three, four important bands, sort of that kind of deal. But um, me, Jimmy and I became friends in 1991 when, you know, at that point with Wicked Game a hit, I was able to do a profile of Jimmy for Guitar Player magazine. And, you know, we kind of hung out, you know, interviewed him for that. And and then we just kind of became friends. And uh, I would go over to his place and he was doing very innovative work um, in terms of, you know, there was a program that had come out that allowed you to do multi-track recording on your computer. And this was the beginning of using the record the computer as a recording studio and jimmy was right at the forefront of that and so i would go over to his place and he'd show me songs that he was working on he'd play them for me and show me how this program worked and uh we just ended up hang hanging out and sometimes we'd, we'd watch like he had all he was a huge rolling stones fans he had all these videos of the rolling stones so sometimes we just kick back and watch you know the rolling stones you know videos for like a couple of hours um you know, and then I was also, I started a, a record company around then, uh, put out a record by the Flame and Groovies. I wanted to put out a Jimmy Wilsey solo album. And I tried to talk him into doing it, but um, it wasn't the time, the right time for him. And for, and I, for obvious reasons now, I didn't realize at the time, but now, now of course, I, I understand some of the things that were going on back then that I didn't know about. But um but anyway, um, yeah, we, we just we just became friends then. And so for, you know, in 91 and 92, we hung out a, a fair amount. And uh, but the thing was that, um, you know, the reason I, I decided to write this this book, Wicked Game, the true story of guitarist James Calvin Wilsey. The reason I decided to do that was because, I mean, when I on Christmas Day, I went on Facebook and I read a post by a photographer named Chester Simpson. And the post said that Jimmy Wilsey had died the day before. And I just about fell over. I just could not believe it. He was only 61 years old. There yeah. was there, you know, it's like, how can this guy be dead? How can this be? I can't believe this, you know? I mean, I was I was stunned. And uh, so then I'm, I'm kind of waiting around over the next few days. I keep looking online for, you know, first for an obituary in one of the San Francisco papers, because Jimmy had lived in San Francisco for 20 years. He had been in two important bands in, the, in San Francisco. He had been very instrumental in an international top 10 hit. So, you know, he should have had an obituary, you know, and there was nothing, absolutely nothing. And he lived in L.A. for 21 years or, or more, and there was nothing in the L.A. Times, and there was nothing in Billboard. And so then I, I got a hold of uh, 
of an editor at Rolling Stone that I was because I had written, you know, worked for Rolling Stone for 10 years. So I wasn't working for Rolling Stone then, but I contacted an editor I knew there and I said, hey, Jimmy Wilsey died. This is important. I mean, there needs to be a story about him and I'd, I'd like to do the story. And uh, and so he went for that. And so I did a 2000 word story about Jimmy Wilsey that ran in, you know, just, you know, within the month, you know, a couple of weeks after he died. And I did that story. And then I just felt like there was more, there was more to Jimmy's story. There was more that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to explore and to write about. And so I did another story. I did a, 8,000 word story for another publication, Rhythm Rhythm Magazine, that um, it's a publication that's in Rhythms that's in Australia that I do a lot, lot for. And so um, they let me ba basically write it whatever I want. And so, um, so I did this long piece about Jimmy. And when I finished that piece, um, Greil Marcus read it and he thought it was great. And he said he knew I was working on a, on a book, another book that was a collection of my writing. He said, you got to include that piece in, in that book. And so I thought, well, you know, I think I should. I, there's more to still more to this. I'm going to I'm going to do a little more work on this story and then I'll include it in that book. Well, pretty soon this thing had turned into kind of a novella. You know, it was like it had just grown and grown. And and so that's when I decided, no, this has got to be a book. There's just, there's like, there's more, there's more, way more here. You know, this is absolutely, his life is certainly justifies a book. And, uh, and I felt like at that point, I really, I wanted Jimmy to be remembered. And yeah. I felt like, you know, every, everybody in the world, practically, they just have to hear those first two notes that he played of the song Wicked Game. And they know the song, they know what's coming. Yeah. Everyone, everyone knows it from the two notes, you know, but most people don't know who played those two notes and you know jimmy just just never got the credit that he really really deserved and so i felt like i wanted to do justice to jimmy i wanted to write a book that was going to um was going to tell people why he was so important but it was also going to be the real deal i mean it wasn't going to be just like you know just pretend like everything was fine. It was going to tell the real story. And unfortunately, his story is a tragedy. But but within that tragedy, I mean, there were really real peaks for him. I mean, he he went pretty, you know, he hit the stars, you know, with with Wicked Game. And, you know, they were they were, you know, touring the US, touring Europe, playing for huge crowds at that point in time. Um you know, he, he had a movie star actress, you know, you know, just before Wicked Game happened, uh, she became his girlfriend. I mean, so he was there was a moment when Jimmy was just at the at the highest peak, so, sort of. Yeah. Um, and I and I and, and then creatively, he had been on a creative role for, you know, pretty much a decade. And, you know, and so I wanted to convey all of that. And uh but I also wanted wanted uh, this book to be kind of be a cautionary tale, and I also wanted it. I wanted to, to one of the things early on I decided I wanted to figure out was, I mean, why did Jimmy become addicted to drugs, and and beyond that, why do certain people become addicted to hard drugs? You know, what's really got me is that the fact that you know you mentioned uh, you mentioned like you know he fought his addiction to, for the last. 30 years and you're thinking about that and you're going like okay so he's 61 so he was like around 30 when he started his you know his you know serious had serious problems was really amazing if you think about it is though here he is on the cusp of the punk rock scene and you think that's what would happen then but he stayed clean all the way through that you know well, relatively well, clean. Yes, well, yes, relatively yes, clean. yes and no i mean he didn't start. Um, he started smoking Persian brown heroin in, in around 1985, but he was um, he was using speed and you know other things uh, back in the, in those days. But he he, as far as I can tell, he was not addicted to drugs back when he was you know in the punk, punk you know no. you know punk years, um, and uh, yeah, 
no, he, he wasn't. And, um, you know, why, uh, is, did, why a, was that the case? Um, is that, I don't is, know. It's sort, of, it's sort of amazing, though, because, I mean, it's one of the things that Chris Isaac really put out there about himself and his bandmates is, especially himself anyway, that, you know, he really was one of the rock, rare rock stars where, you know, he didn't, you know, he might have done this outside the public eye, but why he was in, you know, in the eye, like he might have a beer or two, maybe two. I, I he never smoked. I don't think he didn't smoke at all. Uh, he didn't smoke, so he didn't have that persona. And I think only one of his band members at that time I remember did. I'm not sure the rest of them did. Or, you know, I know a couple of them drink. Basically, what they did, Silvertone, Chris Isaac, and Silvertone put out a wholesome inner, you know, a wholesome image. So yeah, well, well, Chris. I mean, Chris absolutely was like, you know, you're you're right. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't use drugs. I mean, I I don't I mean as far as I know, unless something really changed, Chris never drank. I mean, no. he he like maybe he tried a beer once, you know, yeah. or try something. But you know, as far as I know, he's he's never you know. None of that. And, and he told me, he told me why one of the, well, one of the reasons why, um, you know, what, what, what Chris Isaac said was, you know, I don't understand how, how other singers can be using drugs and drinking and smoking and be able to sing. I don't be either. Able to, be able to hit those notes. Oh. And, and he, and he said, you know, I think I have a real edge on all, you know, on all the, the rockers who were, who were drugging and drinking, you know, and he did because Chris mm -hmm. Isaac was able to be, he was completely, and, and I think to this day, probably, but, but certainly, you know, in the days when, when I knew him and talked to him, um, he, um, you know, he was completely focused. I mean, he was absolutely 100% focused on becoming a rock star and mm -hmm. on writing great songs and on, you know, performing and the whole thing. I mean, and um, and year after year after year, he he stuck at it. And um, as did Jimmy, because Jimmy, too. I mean, Jimmy, you know, many people, you know, if, you know, in the book, many people talk about the fact that they never saw Jimmy without a guitar in his hands. I mean, he'd be walking around the house and he'd have a guitar and he'd be like working on working on stuff. I mean, he'd be hanging out with his girlfriend and they'd be, you know, in the bedroom and he'd be sitting at the edge of the bed, you know, with the guitar and like, work, you know, working out riffs and stuff. I mean, um, that was that was who who Jimmy was. I mean. He he wanted to be the best guitar player, the best musician, the best creative person that he could possibly be, and um, and you know he told me um, in 1987 that you know they wanted meaning at that point you know him and Chris you know they wanted to to make a lot of of records that were great records. They wanted to you know they, he said. You know, you look at the Beatles and, you know, there's a huge catalog of music that they made. You know, bands aren't imp aren't important, you know, because they made one good album. You know, you have to, you know, you you know, and so, you know, the same thing, you know, actors, actors, it's like they've 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 been in, you know, 12 great films or, or 20 great films or, you know, anyway, that's how how Jimmy was was talking to me. And uh you know, and in fact, um, you know, in terms of with Chris Isaac, Jimmy, Jimmy was part of, you know, four, well, I, th I think, you know, really strong albums, um, you know, two absolutely perfect albums, in my opinion, the first, the first two uh, albums, Chris Isaac albums, I think are, are absolutely perfect albums. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, you know, and I think, you know, one of the things I think that really made uh, Jimmy stand out, too, was, you know, like his like, you know, Wicked Game is very soulful, very mournful, uh, uh, you know, very, tw you know, twangy. Uh, but what I really liked about it, but there was still an edge to it. And that was one of the things when, you know, when, that when when you saw Chris Isaac listen to his record versus him live, 
it, it was like the record was really clean and polished, but the, when he played live, he, there was a little bit of an edge to it. You know, there was a, a nice, a nice little crispy edge to his performance because the records were, are, are awesome. But man, hearing him play live, it just made the, it made you really do, or uh, made you appreciate the records a lot more because of the skill that went behind it. Um, and, you know, yeah, obviously, you know, and James played for Chris for, now he played for Silvertone for, for 10 years, right? Um, well, from 1980 until, I mean, he, he left the band in, in 1992. So really almost 12 years or, or actually, you know, pretty much 12 years. Um, now, do we know, do we know back, because back then this is like relatively like, you know, pioneering ground, but. Do you think that there was it was the Chris and the rest of the, of the band? Did they ever have an intervention with Jimmy and try to get him? Because I mean, you know, he's valuable to him, he's family, so to speak. But do you think they ever try to do an intervention with him and and try to get him back on the straight and narrow? Or that there... well, basically, when I mean, there were a lot of factors involved. I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy was um, he became pretty pretty bitter. Um, because he felt like he felt like he deserved more credit, and he felt like he um, he wasn't getting as much money as as he sh he thought that he he should get. And pretty early on, I mean, around 1982, uh, Chris, what's Eric? J See, Eric Jacobson, who was the co-manager and the producer, he was a really big shot guy in the, in the sense that in the sixties, he produced seven top 10 hits for the love and spoonful. And I mean, that was a big deal. Uh, yeah. And, Absolutely. you know, and I mean, yeah, I mean, seven top 10 hits over the course of like two and a half years. And, and then he produced, um, you know, a huge hit for um, Norman Greenbaum spirit in the sky, which I mean, was, was a giant hit. And he produced others, others as well. So when Eric Jacobson shows up at a at a Silvertone gig, and then you know introduces himself, and then you know lets you know lets them know you know you know kind of who, kind of who he is and that he's he's interested potentially in working with them and would like to you know have lunch with with them to like with Chris you know to you know to you know see if there's uh there's some mutual ground there where they can they can work together um that was that was a big deal and um so where am i going with this <laughs> was... uh, well i mean a manager comes in there and, you know you... oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, okay I... okay so here's the thing um so eric jacobson he thought chris isaac was a star when he, when he saw him live he thought this guy has got the charisma mm -hmm. and he's got the vocal chops now, and the looks. now, now, well, yeah. And the looks, mm -hmm. but he, um, his, you know, it was like, he said, you know, Chris was hitting a lot of wrong notes, but he was hitting all the right notes too. And so he knew that if with enough work, you know, Chris could really be a great singer. And he also saw the potential in terms of the songs, the songwriting. And so anyway, once Eric Jacobson is involved as the manager and the producer, um, well, then it was sort of like, well, Chris Isaac is the star, and then everyone else is, you know, part of the, part of the band. But Chris is like one one up, you know, yeah. and so, and they, you know, after a while they they got rid of um, the drummer, the original. Well, that wasn't the they got rid of the drummer and bass player that were in the band at the time Eric Jacobson showed up because Eric Jacobson was an absolute perfectionist in the recording studio. And he just felt that those guys could, couldn't cut it in the studio. They couldn't keep the, the tempo solid and they, they just couldn't do what he wanted the rhythm section to do. And so subsequently it was Eric Jacobson, Jimmy Wilsey and Chris Isaac who <laughs> made the first Chris Isaac album. And it was really those three guys who made the second album as well. I mean, um, Raleigh and Kenny, the drummer and bass player, um, they probably 
played on some of the second album, maybe a lot of it, but they definitely didn't play on all of it because, I mean, because um, they brought in, Isaac um, and Jacobson and, and Jimmy, I mean, they brought in um, the drummer from the tubes and uh, and this and the bass play uh, a session bass player who would play they'd used on the first album they brought those guys back in for the second album to work on a number of the tracks uh, you know it's just it just because I mean Jacobson was a perfectionist and he needed in the studio he needed to have musicians who could really rise to the occasion Jimmy was a musician who was able to do that and uh, you know and then you know but. In 1982, Isaac had the other guys in the band sign contracts that basically said that he could fire them at any time and that um, and that those guys were going to get 20 percent and he was going to get 40 percent. And then but then when he fired the drummer and bass player and then when they moved forward, when they eventually hired Raleigh and Kenny, those guys were salaried. And so now Jimmy was getting 20 and Chris Isaac was getting 80. And this is, we're talking about the record royalties. You know, we're not talking, I mean, J Chris Isaac took all the publishing and all the songwriting, but in terms of record royalties, Jimmy was getting 20%. And, and he was not happy about getting 20% no. because he had co-founded the, you know, the S silver tone essentially the version of silver tone that um there was a there was a trio originally that jimmy wasn't part of isaac broke that band up him and jimmy got together they after a little while they formed a new version of silver tone jimmy brought in a bass player they brought back the old drummer but they were partners in that band but sure. when but they weren't partners anymore when you know they had a sign, you know, when he had to sign that contract. Can, so, can, I stop, can I stop you real quick? I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt your train of thought. But I, I just want you to explain to the chat because you've seen this how this worked before. Um, could you could you walk us through? Because he's seen plenty of uh, uh you know, uh, showcases, musical showcases for bands. Can you can you walk us through what that what that what that is? I mean, what what do you mean? Because you mentioned something. You mentioned uh, uh you mentioned how. You know, Jacobson came in and he fired the the the, the guitar, you know, the guitar, the bass player and, and the uh, drummer. I mean, think about this. I mean, this is always this has always perplexed me. It's like, a, you know, here they were, Jimmy and and Chris and his two other friends, the bass player. And the, I mean, they were friends. They were friends. Let's get a band together, right? Let's let's do a band. Well, not not really. I mean, what, no, no, it wasn't like that. Basically. Um, um, originally, Chris Isaac came up to the came up to the Bay Area from Stockton, and he um, um, this guy Mark Plummer, who was a was a journalist in England, came over to San Francisco, and was looking to manage bands in the punk scene, and he was at a party, and he heard this tape. And the tape was of, of Chris Isaac singing a George Jones country song. And he heard that and he says, I got to meet this guy. This this voice is incredible. Uh, you know, I, I want to manage this guy. Well, eventually he did, was able to locate Chris Isaac. And Isaac was, was a, you know, wanted him to manage him. And so Mark Plummer said to Chris Isaac, well, who's who do you want in your band? And, oh, wow. and Chris Isaac had seen um, this guy, John Silvers, who was a drummer. He'd seen him playing in some other bands. He said, well, John Silvers would be great for drums. And, and he wanted Jimmy Wilsey to play bass. And so Mark Plummer got Silvers and Chris together, and they hit it off. Um, Jimmy didn't want to play bass anymore. He wanted to play guitar. And sure. so he turned, the, her, turned it down. And then, um, and then the original bass player was a situation where, <laughs> so, well, it didn't even matter because, but so anyway, there was this trio, but it wasn't like it was a trio of friends. It was a trio of, it was, of music, it was, wow. You know? And so then, um, they were. It was basically a rockabilly band, and and then Isaac got sick of that, and yeah. so he and so he broke up the band. Thank but by that point, he'd already met Jimmy. Jimmy was doing sound actually for. 
the trio. And Jimmy had started showing Chris how to play the lead guitar parts to a lot of these rockabilly songs. And they also had bonded over um, a love of country music. And so they were just kind of working together, you know, on the side. So when Chris broke up the trio, then those two guys kept working together. And then Jimmy was was in a cab. <laughs> this is pretty crazy. He's he takes a cab and it, and he starts talking. The, the radio is on. He starts talking to the driver about the songs that are playing on the radio. And at a certain point, Jim says, "Well, are you a musician?" And the guy says, "Yeah, I play bass. I, I play stand up bass." Jimmy's like, "You play stand up bass? We're interested in you." And he goes, "We? Who's we?" And he said, "Well." Um, there's this guy named Chris Isaac. He's a singer and I'm working with him and we'd like to audition you. And so that's where the bass player for wow. the version of Silvertone that, that Jimmy and Chris started came from. And then they brought John Silver's the drummer back. Okay. So it, it wasn't like Eric Jacobson, wasn't like Eric Jacobson just said, okay, now I'm working with you, Chris. Now we're going to fire these guys. It, it didn't work. It wasn't like that. It was like over time, they went into the studio to do demos. And every time they went into the studio to do the demos, Jacobson was frustrated because the rhythm section wasn't pulling it off. And for the most part. He just and, but, but but the thing was, the other thing was Jacobson taught Chris and Jimmy how to listen to music, how to like actually when you're in the studio. How, to, to actually know what you're listening to. And he would point out to him and he'd say, look, look at how the rhythm section is like moving all over the place. It's not a constant tempo, which is what we need. We yeah. need, the tempo needs to just be rock solid, like a metronome, you know, and that's not happening. And so as these guys got educated to where they could really hear, you know, then it was like Chris Isaac understood too. He could see that it wasn't working. So, so it was like, I mean, Chris Isaac was the one who fired the guys. It wasn't Eric Jacobson. And he fired them because they weren't meeting up to, you know, his standards at that point anymore. They were, they were really fine live. They were, they were good live. This is what they, what I was told. And I saw them and I thought they were great live, but, they just weren't making it happen in the studio um, at the level that um, Jacobson and Isaac, you know, and Jimmy felt when it was, was necessary. And so that's, that's how that happens. And, um, and yes, they were, I mean, yes, Chris and, and John Silvers had, had become friends, but um, you know, as Isaac said, he wasn't going to let anything hold him back. Yeah. You know, and that's another artist that was just like that on the in the country scene, and that was uh, Garth Brooks. He, and when I'm hearing you, I'm just hearing Garth Brooks' story was pretty much almost almost like how you said it, how how it was for Chris. And as far as the rockabilly thing, that was you know you know this too by covering it. But uh, Chris Isaac very famously, uh, and uh, the first thing on his writers was no rockabilly or or, or Americana acts ever. I mean, he didn't want he didn't want he didn't want those on stage because a lot of times they would tour and they let the you know they let the club or wherever book the opener and invariably they would put a rockabilly banner for them and he was just like no uh uh so we we got a lot of different type of bands in front of him some amazing bands some different bands um so that was you know that was that was fun uh but but you but I was gonna say you've been to musical you know record label showcases though right you see the bands play. Yeah. Sure. And then, then, and then the, uh, and then the, the, the record label guy will walk over to the band and sit there and say, "Yeah, you need a, you know, you need a gu new guitarist. You need a new drummer. You know, you need a new bass player. You know, whatever it is, new vocalist. It's not working out. You know, and 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 a lot of these bands, especially down in L.A., they all came there to chase the dream together. You know, we all drove out together. You know, we came from Oklahoma or Texas or whatever. They're all friends. They, you know, the band was organic." And then um, they go there, play the, they play the, the, they play their showcase, and the same thing happened to those bands, like, like uh, uh, you know what happened, you know with Silvertone, and they just walk up there, you know, and, and sit there and say, yeah, they're just not cutting it, and these bands would just get rid of their players, their friends, 
you know, and 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 get you know, well, we got some people we could suggest for you, and they slide them on in, and you know, and the band became a, a less than a band more than as a cookie cutter. Um, no, I didn't. I I was I was not aware of Silvertones. Uh, no, I I just thought that they had formed, and then you know, and they had, you know, because I know band members come and go, and, and and regardless, you know, however it happens, they always come and go. Um, I know that when you got Raleigh and you got Larry. Um, those two, those three, those three guys were just hilarious on stage together. It, it was perfect. The crowd just absolutely loved that, loved that lineup. Um, I, I do remember that. I mean, they, you know, famously so. Um, so, so, so he he only got twenty percent though. Man. Yeah, and so that was the thing. Was that was really the other thing that happened was um, that Jimmy came up with some riffs that Chris took and turned into songs early on. And so um, basically it was suggested and kind of by Eric Jacobson and all I mean, and, and they were basically the idea was that maybe Chris and Jimmy could be songwriting partners. And so they, they talked about that. And, but according to Jimmy, Chris wanted um, Jimmy to take five percent, and he'd take ninety-five percent, and and Jimmy was just like, no, no, that's not right. You know, that, that's not that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if we're going to be songwriting partners, why? You know, so they didn't become songwriting partners, but that was kind of the beginning of uh, of kind of a bitterness on on Jimmy's part, and. And then when the 20% thing happened, you know, and so as time went on, so it was a weird, it was a strange relationship because on the one hand, Jimmy really liked working with Chris Isaac, you know, and they were, they were, you know, they worked really well together. And, and as Jimmy talked about it, I mean, I mean, Jimmy was really responsible for the sound and Chris Isaac was, you know, the songwriter and the singer, but that sound, that atmosphere that, you know, you hear, you know, on those early albums, I mean, that was Jimmy. And um, I mean, you know, and I'm not the only one who, who says that. I mean, anyone who, I mean, Joel Selvin for the San Francisco Chronicle, he wrote an article where, where he talked about the Wilsey sound and Jimmy was the sound. And Chris was the the songwriter and the vo and the vocalist and the front guy, you know. And that was the that was the balance of of it. And um, but that's you know. So here Jimmy was was really responsible for you know fifty percent of you know you could say you know of of what it was what their music was. But you know he wasn't he wasn't getting his his fair share now that wasn't such a big deal for years because they weren't selling any significant amount of records. So there wasn't a whole lot of money. You right. know? It only became a big deal when Wicked Game happened. And suddenly, you know, they're selling millions of records and, mm -hmm. you know, big, big checks are coming in for Chris Isaac. And I mean, a lot of money was coming into Jimmy too. Yeah. But it's all all relative. I mean, Jimmy ended up owing the IRS one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in taxes because he never paid his taxes because he spent all the money on drugs and equipment, and uh, you know, and so. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, by the time um, by the time um, you know, wicked the wicked game thing happened. Uh, you know that re the relationship they had was pretty. Um, it was pretty on edge, I guess you could say. Basically, he was just showing up for the tours, and that's about it. Well, no, I mean it wasn't like that. I mean they they worked on the. I mean, no, they, I mean they worked on these records together. I mean, you know, and they, you know, they would they would play the songs. The songs got written. They would tour playing the songs before they recorded them like almost everything that ended up on the second album they played when they were touring for the first album 
and this and a, a lot of the stuff same thing for the for the third album the one that wicked game was on so and and they were working together on on this stuff i mean it wasn't like it wasn't a thing it wasn't like that i mean it wasn't like jimmy was just showing up and punching punching the the clock no it wasn't like that i mean he was into it but you know there were you can you can have multiple levels to things you know and at the same time that he could be you know bitter about the fact that he's kind of not getting what he thinks he deserves he can still really dig making records you know working on the guitar parts to songs um you know it's you know those two things can both co can coexist and they did coexist now when you were talking to jimmy i mean you you guys were still you guys were obviously for friends during this period did you did you notice when did you notice first notice that he was having problems you know like you know you know you being close to him you being close to music the way you were i'm sure you were able to spot a lot of car crashes before they happened you know unfortunately well no that was the weird thing and and i'm not the only one jimmy was amazingly good at concealing the fact that he was using hard drugs and maybe the, the other thing was that, um, and I talked to Lenny Kay, you know, who was, you know, Patty Smith's guitar player, who's, you know, a, you know, a well-known rock critic um, and a rock historian um, about this because he, he was friends with Jimmy and, you know, and, and he's, he's been around the block and, he, and he's, you know, he said, you know, uh, musicians are able to use drugs for a long time without it messing them up. And they can they can do there's a lot of different ways they can they can uh, that can happen or a number of ways anyway. I mean, they can do what's called chipping, where they're using enough of the drug to keep themselves from going into a withdrawal. But it's not like they're like so spaced out and, and high that they can't keep it together. It's it's just sort of it's like a maintenance almost kind of a situation. And yeah. so anyway, when I was hanging out with Jimmy, I was not aware that Jimmy was, was using heroin. And I only found out later. I mean, the point where it started, I started to like go, something weird is going on was when Jimmy stopped answering the phone. Like you'd call and, and before he, he, you know, he'd answer the phone and, Hey, this is a good time to come by or, you know, Hey, what's happening. Hey, and he'd say, Hey, you want to come by or what, you know? And, and then suddenly you'd be calling and he wasn't answering. And I'd go over. So then I'd drive over to his place and, you know, I'd knock on the door and there'd be no answer. And I'd go around the side because there was a window that looked in on where he had his computer, you know, recording set up. And sometimes I'd look in there and he'd be in there. And then I'd knock on the window and he'd see it was me. And then he'd come around and let me in the, in the door. Um, but other times he, he either wouldn't be there or he wasn't. I couldn't see him there. He might have been there, but I couldn't see it. Well, that's when I started wondering. And then, and then one time I called him up and he told me that um, his bicycle had just been stolen. And I am, I'm asking him about this. And he tells, he says, well, I went across the street. I rode the, I took my bike across the street to the bank to get some money. And I left my bike outside the bank. And when I came back out, it was gone. And he hadn't locked the bike. He had, I mean, it was a completely, ridiculous situation. I mean, you would never in the Haight Ashbury in San Francisco, you would never leave a good quality 10 speed bike without locking it. But right. that's what Jimmy had done. And so then I'm thinking, boy, something is weird, really weird here. But it was only later that, um, you know, I, I found out that, you know, yeah, he had been using heroin, um, you know, and uh, so, yeah, but, but one thing that did happen while I was hanging out with him was that he started talking about how he started talking about how he was quitting. He was going to quit working with Isaac. And I was like shocked when I heard that. I'm like, Jimmy, you're going to quit working with Isaac. I mean, finally you have the hit that you've wanted to have for 12 years. And, and you know, now's not the time to quit, man, <laughs> you know, but he was adamant. Wow. He was adamant about it. And I think actually 
he may have already, it's possible that he had already been fired at that point because he told everybody that he quit. But he, but in actuality, that's not the way it went down. Um, in terms of people I talked to who who really knew what was, was going on. And I actually talked to some people after I finished the book, after the book was already set in type, um, I talked to some additional people who confirmed to me that um, he had been he had been fired. Uh, yeah. Was but, but was he, was he fired for the drug use or was he yeah. fired? Because, oh wow. yeah, he was fired because he was showing up uh, stoned and yeah. unable to play his parts when they were doing. You know, Jacob, you know Jacobson was uh, you know he he you know that guy had been around the block many many times. He knew the signs probably too, and he just probably wasn't going to tolerate it. But, you know, that leads me to this, you know, you, you know, you wrote for Rolling Stone for 10 years, 10 years, Rolling Stone writer right here, uh, editor and writer, senior writer, wrote cover stories. Dude, you're a rock star yourself, Michael. I mean, back in the day when, when Rolling Stone was just on, on point, you know, uh, come out with great, uh, great, uh, uh, great issues. You bought the first out, you bought the first issue of Rolling Stone. Um, someone here mentioned earlier about Jim Morrison. Uh, tell us your Jim Morrison story. Cause someone's commenting about Jim Morrison. Yeah. I want to have a dream where Jim Morrison tells me I, I I'll put on a concert. Well, why don't you tell us your story about uh, Jim Morrison real quick? Um, well, <laughs> my Jim Morrison story is that when I was about 13 years old, I went to, um, up to Mount Tamalpais for a for, They had a festival called, uh, the magic mountain uh, music festival and and the thing this this was a pretty incredible they bust everybody up there you could not take a car up there and mount tamalpais it's this, it's a you know it's beautiful mountain there's an amphitheater up fairways up the mountain a beautiful amphitheater and so for this two day rock festival which cost about 2 dollars a day Back in 1967. Okay. <laughs> this is 1967. Okay. $2 a day. I mean, the Jefferson Airplane, the Birds, Captain Beefheart, the Doors. Um, oh, God. Who? I mean, it was just like two days of incredible bands. And so Jim Morrison was there and he was, he was like hanging around, you know. And so me and this friend of mine, we went up to him and he, you know, he, he basically like, you know, signed the autograph for us. And, um, and then I, I took photographs here. I am, I'm 13 years old. I had a little brownie camera, but I took photographs of Jim Morrison performing and I still have those photographs and they're actually pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> um, but you know, um, the, the other story is there's, there's my Van Morrison story. And Van Morrison, I had a more substantial, though um, though frustrating, time with because Van Morrison, um, there was a point where he he just stopped doing interviews, and he just wasn't doing doing interviews. This was like you know in the early eighties, he's not doing any interviews, but he decides to put on a concert. Um, in San Francisco at a fairly large hall. And so Bill Graham was, uh, was that, was that Bimbo's? No, 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 no. It's actually, God, what's the place called? It's the, um, it's the palace of fine arts. And they oh, had okay. an amphitheater or not an amphitheater, but they had a theater inside the palace of fine arts. Right. Um, and so it was not a place where rock concerts ever happened. Right. Which is just why Van Morrison wanted to play there. Because at this point in time, Van Morrison no longer considered himself a rock musician and didn't want to be associated with rock and roll. And so anyway, in order to like be sure that they filled the, filled the place, he agreed to do an interview. And so um, he, he tell, I get this phone call the night before and it's like, okay, Van Morrison's willing to talk to you and um, you know, he's going to meet you at this restaurant in Mill Valley. 
at this time. So I go there and he shows up and he he's he's very uncomfortable. I mean, he's just, you know, it he looks like for being a recluse, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so you know, he's clearly not thrilled to be doing an interview, but at the same time, there he is. So we go we go sit outside on this this patio, sort of this an inner courtyard. We sit on this patio in the inner courtyard at this restaurant, order some food. And um, so I start, I turn on the tape recorder, I start interviewing him. And I mean, it was one of the most challenging interviews that I had ever done because, I mean, a lot of the times I'd ask him a question and he just he was like, I don't want to talk about that. You know, he, he didn't want to answer any questions about his personal life. That was completely off the table. But even talking about, you know, music, um, I mean, he didn't want to talk about the old days. He didn't want to talk about them. He didn't want to, you know, it was like, so. Um, was he being honest about this, about this, uh, uh, Michael? Was he being honest about it? Or did he feel like he was just putting on, you know, the, the rock star persona? Or, or was or was he genuinely like, yeah, I'm just not really comfortable with that? No, no, no. He wasn't putting on a rock star persona at all. I mean, so he, he really I, I didn't, didn't I didn't think he was there was anything about him that came. I mean, he was he was like the guy who would be like working in the at the like at the smoke shop or something. I mean, he didn't look like a rock star. He didn't talk like a rock star. He just talked like it was just like, you know, your uncle show, you know, is, is showing up and he's in a disagreeable mood. You know, I mean, that was kind of that was kind of the vibe. And um you know, but he really had strong opinions about how he didn't play rock and roll anymore. He didn't want to have anything to do with rock and roll. And so he, he kind of talked for a bit, you know, he, he would talk about that. And he would, you know, there were things that he, that he did talk about. But at a certain point, he was like, well, I want to go. And I said, well, I'm not really done interviewing you, you know. He said, well, look, come to my house. Um, you know, on Monday, you know, I don't remember. You know, it was like, come to my house on Monday at such and such a time and we can finish this. And mm -hmm. so he actually gave me the address of his house. So I, on you know, on, on the Monday, I drive up to his house, knock on the door. No one's there. <laughs> so, so I, he's got this like beautiful garden, and so I, I go down and I, I just, there's a chair there. And so I take a seat. I'm sitting there. I mean, there's hummingbirds, flow, flow, you know, there's like a deer comes and actually like runs through the garden while I'm just sitting there. Um, it was beautiful and a beautiful scene. And eventually, I mean, I, I wait about an hour and eventually a car pulls into the driveway. And so I start walking up. And he gets out of the car and then I call out to him and he sees me and he freaks out. It was like he'd completely forgotten or, or something. But anyway, he's just like, no, no, I, I said, well, you know, you told me to come here with him so we could finish the interview. He says, yeah, I know, but I forgot. I had, I had this other stuff I had to do. And, you know, he had this excuse and that excuse. And then it was like, um, well, I got, I got to go. I mean, um, you know what? Give me a call and we'll figure out another time and then we can finish this. And of course that was it. That's the last I ever saw of him. I was going to say, know. you didn't bother calling him. You know, I did call him, but oh, you did. I, I oh. called him. I left a message. I probably called him a couple of times and left messages. You know, he didn't call me back. It was just, you know, so I, you know, luckily I had enough material. And then I also interviewed a whole bunch of other people who, you know, people who worked with him and, you know, record producer and manager, you know, just different people. And uh, so I ended up writing a story about that for Rolling Stone. And uh, yeah, so uh, but that's so that's my Van Morrison story, which is, I think, is a more interesting story. <laughs> but, um, although my memory of Jim Morrison is also pretty great and seeing the doors live on Mount Tamil Pius, this is shortly after um, Light My Fire became a hit. So Jim Morrison at that point 
was not all messed up. Jim right. Morrison was at the top of his form. His singing was fantastic. The whole band were absolutely fantastic. And so to be, and, and you know, when you're a kid, when you're like 13, 12, 13 years old, everything is like kind of luminous. I mean, everything is bigger and brighter and, and then, than it is years and years later, you know, when you've been around the block and you're an adult, everything is brand new. And so, I mean, I'd never been in a rock festival before. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. And the, and the doors were incredible and the birds were incredible and the Jefferson airplane and, and big brother and the holding company, you know, with Janis Joplin. I mean, so, um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Wow! Yeah, what a what a what a great. Uh, how how old were you, how old were you when you uh, when you started at Rolling Stone? Um, I was thirty years old at, when I started at Rolling Stone. I think think I was I think I had just turned thirty. Uh, is that right? Let me think. Yeah, eighty four. Yeah, I was thirty when I started. I had the thing was you got to realize the first issues of Rolling Stone came out in nineteen sixty seven. Yeah. And I started reading Rolling Stone then. And you got pretty, the first issue. And I pretty quick decided that I actually think that I got the second issue. I saw the first issue and I and I read it in the store, Tides Books in Sausalito. <laughs> you know, but, some things don't change, I, do they? <laughs> but, but then I bought the second issue and then I bought every issue after that and then I subscribed. I mean, and I decided probably within the first year of starting to read Rolling Stone that I wanted to be a rock critic because the thing was, it was like these guys who are writing these stories, they get to hang out with the musicians. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, as a teenager, I thought that would be the coolest thing in the world to hang out with the musicians and to be able to, to write about them and to actually see what that world was really like. And um, so anyway, the thing was that, so I started, I mean, in junior high school, I started, writing writing about music and then in high school i was like the arts editor at the at the you know high school paper and i wrote a muse column for the high school paper and then you know in college i wrote for the college paper and then i started writing for like the alternative weekly you know and so the thing was by um by like 1975 i had already put in a lot of years of writing about music you know, in a, in a, a non-professional kind of way. And so then in 1975, I sold my first story, you know, got, got actually got paid. And I then spent basically the next eight, nine years, a hundred percent focused on getting a job at Rolling Stone. And when I say, you know, focused on that, what I mean is, Every story that I would write during that period of time, I wrote it as if I was writing a story for Rolling Stone. And I was at that during that time, I was writing for the Berkeley Barb. I was writing for the San Francisco Bay Guardian. Eventually, I was writing for the San Francisco Chronicle. You know, I got pieces into various slick magazines like New Times and New West. And, you know, you know, you know, so I'm writing, you know, Trouser Press and then, you know, Cream. And, you know, yeah. I'm getting pieces into different places. But. I'm always thinking, you know, and, and I kind of studied how the stories were put together for Rolling Stone. And, and so basically I spent nine years doing everything I could to learn how to write a great story for that would fit it in Rolling Stone. And, and, you know, it worked because at a certain point I started doing freelance stories for them. And then a few years later I got hired and then I was on staff for a decade. Uh, but it was, it was like a, it was that, you know, that focus I was talking about with Chris Isaac. Well, I had that same, that same focus that's I've had uh, in terms of the various endeavors that I've done in my life. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Your career. I mean, your career is just uh, amazing. I mean, you know, you were based in San Francisco too for your 10 years, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was really great because I, I, I was, you know, I didn't have to deal with all the office politics or any of that. I was just like, I was working, I was on staff, but I was working out of my house in San Francisco, which was just great. You know, I could just roll out of bed, have some breakfast, you know, go up to my office, you know, get the computer going and, you know, um, 
start, you know, start making calls to, you know, do the interviews I needed to do or get get you know, whatever information I needed to get at that particular moment for whatever I was working on. And uh, yeah, it was pretty great. What, what, what was your impression of BAM? You know, I don't I don't really I'd rather not talk about about BAM. I mean, it, it, it really wasn't a publication that meant much to me either. <laughs> I have my stories too. I, I just wanted to know what was your off the cuff uh, observation on it. I, I thought it could have been good, but uh, I just no. I, I I wasn't a big fan either. Um, so how often? I mean, you know, being writing writing for a, a national magazine. I mean, you know, you really couldn't. Did you feel like you had the creative freedom to like you know go down and cover like the San Francisco Bay Area club scene? Or, or did you have to write about the much bigger shows? Or and did you ever did you ever meet and and uh, interview Bill? Uh, um, uh, oh gosh, no, I just broke. Bill Graham. Yeah, Bill Graham. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll I'll answer all of that. Um, um basically, um, it kind of worked a couple of different ways. Um, I had this the greatest editor for most of the time I was at Rolling Stone. His name was Jim Hinkey. He's he's uh, no longer with us. He passed passed away some years ago. But Jim Hinkey was was really a great editor, and the reason he was a great editor was because you could learn from him. I mean, he would like the one of the first feature stories or first stories that I did for him was a story about the indie record scene. There were these new record companies that were that had started up that were independent companies like like Howie Klein had 415 Records in the Bay Area and um, and then there was Slash Records that Bob Biggs had I think it's Bob Biggs in L.A. and yeah. and there were a couple of other ones and so. This was a new thing. I mean, there hadn't been, it had been a long, long time since the 50s or early 60s, since there had really been independent record companies. And so suddenly they were they were popping up. And so this was a trend piece. So I write this story and I turn it in. And I and I had like what what, what you would call a feature lead, a soft lead on the on the story. Um, and Jim Hinkey said, This is a great story, but it needs a news lead. And I argued with him a little bit. He said, no, you know, Young and Winter isn't going to go for this story with the lead you have on it. it. It has to have a news lead. And so so I wrote a news lead for it. And then the story ran. And then I realized that he was right about that, that it was um, it was a much stronger story with the news lead than with the, the kind of soft lead that I, I had originally, you know, you know, started and can so you, that was that was the kind of a, could you explain i'm sorry could you explain to us what a news lead is well a news lead would be something something to the effect of um you know in the past three years five independent record companies have come into existence uh in the united states um da, 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 da. i mean you're you're basically laying out the news you know what's the news in the, that this story is and you're telling the reader the important news right off the bat. Whereas the feature lead was something like, you know, you know, 415 Records owner Howie Klein is tooling his, um, you know, uh, Volkswagen down Mission Street. And he, as, he, as he talks to me about his, uh, about the records that he's putting out this week. Okay. You know, it's it's a much softer thing. It's not it's not giving you the news. You know, it might be a really interesting telling you some interesting things, um, but it's not giving you the news. And so um, so that was something that I learned right off the bat from Jim Hinkey was, you know, a lot of times you really need to do a news lead on these stories to make them work for us. And, um, you know, and, and I learned a lot of other a lot of things from from him um you know about about writing and about journalism you know and then sure. i also figured out a whole lot of things myself you know over, over the years uh, and and i like i said told you i mean i had i studied stories that i thought were really good i i would like analyze them and and figure out well why is that story so good and so that i could learn from it and uh, and try to have the elements that really made for a strong story 
in my stories. Um, and so, um, anyway, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I oh, got yeah. it. Okay. That's cool. So, That's cool. Oh yeah. So, so, so sometimes I would come up with the idea for the story. Sometimes, um, Jim would, would have an idea for a story or, or maybe Jan passed us an idea down. It all, it all just, um, you know, it was different from story to story. Um, I mean, for example, when James Brown, uh, you know, he, he got arrested for, I don't know if you remember this, this thing, but he, he was, his office was in this mall and he went into this, um, this classroom with a shotgun and he like, he was high on angel dust and he, threatened yeah. the people in there because he said they were using his bathroom and then there was like this two-state chase where the police were, were you know chasing him and he's like driving him, you know it's an insane thing and he ends up uh you know he ends up in jail you know for like three years or something and but anyway so um so jim says hey we want you to go to augusta georgia and we want you to to do a you know we want you to do this a story about James Brown and what's what's gone on in James Brown's life, you know. So that was a story that that came, as I, I'm pretty sure, came from from him. You know, on the other hand, there would be stories where you know I would come up with with the idea. Like for example, uh, there were all these bands that were coming. This was post punk kind of period, but there were these bands like in L.A. there was Black Flag, and and in Minneapolis there was the Replacements, and you know and there was Husker Du. And uh, in San Francisco, Flipper and and L.A. the Minutemen, and you know, and so I basically said, said you know, there's a post-punk scene happening. There's there's you know, punk is not over. It's no. it's just moved into a new phase, and I think we should do a story about the, you know about this what's happening, this kind of new scene and this new situation. And so uh, he he agreed with me, and so uh, so I did that story. Uh, which was, you know, called, is, is called Punk Lives. And uh, yeah, so it would just, you know, it, it would go, it would go both ways. But also, I, you know, a lot of times I would suggest, uh, I could suggest a band like, like, well, Silvertone is a good example. I mean, I basically said, hey, this incredible album is coming out and we should, you know, we should do a story on this band. And you know, he listened to the album. He agreed it was a strong album. And so so I did the first, you know, one of the first uh, national stories, if not the first national story on, on Silvertone. And then later I wrote about Counting Crows, uh, sort of the first national story, I think, on the Counting Crows. Did you, did you really? Yeah. I, 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 uh, uh, so I've told this story here. A couple of people in the chat might remember this, but I have, I have a Counting Crow story for you. Uh they were uh, they were scheduled to play at this club in San Jose. Uh, they're supposed to come down and play opening spot on a Wednesday for fifty bucks. Uh, and uh, so, but they got a call about the about they're going to play a showcase. They set up a showcase, so they had to call the club owner and says, "Listen, um, you know, we, we have to cancel our opening spot on a Wednesday in San Jose because we're going to do play a, a showcase." And the, the, the owner of the club says, well, if you, if you don't come down and play the show like you're supposed to, then you'll never play here again. And the guy says, I, I'm sorry. I, I I understand. And he was right. They never played there again. <laughs> they, went there, they went there and got signed off the showcase. <laughs> but I'm, just, I'm just like, oh, my God, the arrogance of some people. Um, I love the fact that you got to write about Silvertone before they popped. Now that was always my favorite because I was a talent buyer in in the area for ten years from uh from eighty nine to ninety nine. That was that was when I worked, and um and and uh I I, I really enjoyed that aspect of the job too. You know, the, it was finding out what was coming down the road, um and I had some you know, you know I I I you know you and I both know, and I'm sure Jimmy's not the only person that you know that you lived to you lost that way, um. We, you know, we, you know, we've seen the good side. We could talk about the high, but you, you, you've seen your fair share of tragedy too. I mean, so I'm sure you saw there's a lot of bands that you became friends with, or you wrote about, or any and stuff like, or was watched in concert, you know, or or being watched in the club scene. Um, what, what was been what was the hardest part about being a a, a national writer? Was it seeing seeing some of these folks? I mean, it was great seeing their success. You thrilled to it, like. For Chris, he thrilled to it. 
Um, but what was some of the well, you know, because he because this book for you know Jimmy made such an impression on you. Um, you know, it's it's what who you know who, what what will inspire I me? Mean, you know, it sounds a cliche, but what was the you know because he's seen so many. I'm sure he's seen so many artists go down uh, the, down the bad path. But what made Jimmy's story stand out for you? Oh, because the way it rolled out, because you were friends with him, but I'm sure you're friends with other band with other band members too. Well, I mean, it was a combination of uh, it was just a lot of factors that sort of came together, you know, in the wake of him dying, you know, and I mean, certainly the fact that we had been friends uh was was a factor and the fact that i had i had just loved i mean silver tone you know and those records remain some of my very favorite records i mean i i listen you know i listen to that first silver tone album you know i've i've never stopped listening to it you know it's sure. not like i listen to it all the time but but i've listened to it you know probably every year at least i listen to it i get into it for a while and i mean i have i have all kinds of bootleg recordings of silvertone from their prime when jimmy was in the band you know and i mean i love those recordings and um it's just they were just you know they were just one of those bands and it was like maybe i, I don't know maybe if i had been in london and and um you know maybe i would feel the same way about you know uh, you know, so you know, I don't, I don't know, the Clash or or something. You know, although I love the love the Clash, but I mean, you know, maybe part of it was because I was friends. Part of it was because you know, but because I loved them, it all came it came from the music. That's why I that's why I kept I wrote about them. That's why I kept writing about them. That's why I kept going to the shows. I mean, you know, I would go to, you know, there were times, I mean, they, you know, I would, they would play club nine for like four nights and I'd go every night, you know, I mean, they were just so, they were so great. And, um, and so, um, so cut it. So, so that's where it starts is that I just thought they were one of, one of the great, great bands and that the music was just so powerful and it just it just touched me in, in such a strong way and and then of course being for you know being friends with jimmy that that was a factor and then um you know the fact of him it just hit me so much the fact of him um dying at such a young age and and then it just i gotta say i mean it made me mad that yeah there you go he, he, that he didn't get he didn't get written about, you know, when he, after he died, it, it was like, this isn't right. No. This is not right. You know, this, this guy deserves, you know, you know, whatever happened in his life, he still deserves to be recognized for, for what he, what he gave to, to us. Because, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, think of all the, I mean, just my, myself, all the hours and hours, you know, of, of enjoyment I've gotten out of listening to those records, you know. And were you mad, were you mad at him too, Michael? What were you, mad at him? Were, were, are you? Were you and are you? Are you mad at him today? No, no, no. It's not being mad at Jimmy. It's being mad that he didn't get recognized. It's being mad that like that the media didn't cover him. That you know, I mean, I put this in the book, but you know, he dies, and then the Grammys, you know come up pretty quick not that long after he dies and um one of the guys at you know jimmy made a sol solo album in the in 2008 a great solo album called el dorado and one of the guys who worked at the record company lakeshore records um was friends with the guy who was running um the grammys at at that po that point and and so he went to them and and said um they, you know, his wife actually his wife worked for for the guy I think and 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 they went to, went to him and said could you include Jimmy Wilsey in among the people who died this past musicians who had died this past year that you know they always feature as part of the Grammys and the guy wouldn't do it and that was the kind of you know that was just it's like this guy was important why is nobody recognizing that you know and so. I, I just wanted him to be recognized, you know, oh, and, you and, know. And, and as I got, and I also have to say, 
the more I got into researching his life and his story, the more I felt like this is really, um, this is worthy of a book. You know, there's, there's just a lot here. And, and, you know, the thing about this book is it's Jimmy's story, but it's also it, in a certain sense, it's the story of every sort of, you know, side guy in a band, every, every musician who's not the front man, who's not the charismatic lead singer, but who's really important to that band. You know, there's a lot of guys and women, you know, to some degree as well, who, you know, their role in the band, they just, it's just never recognized how important they are. And they get kind of a raw deal, you know? And um, so, so Jimmy's story, it, it's much, it's, it's bigger than Jimmy, you know, in terms of telling kind of what can happen to a musician and then, you know, in, in these, in these kind of roles. And so there's that part of it, but then there's also, you know, this is also the story of, you know, the San Francisco punk scene, you know, and within the story, it's the story of the Avengers and within, within the Jimmy story is the story of Silvertone and the story of Chris Isaac and really the story of the dark side of the music business and the dark side of rock and roll. All of that is contained in this book. And, um, I'm just yeah. still, I'm still sort of blown away by by the you know the timing of it for him, you know I I I just it sort of hurts my heart hearing about that you know because it's like you think that once you get up to you know maybe he wasn't using hard drugs you know you know, maybe he was I don't know when you know I don't know what year he was when he started that you know was he 27 or 20 or whatever um, because you know I knew a, I knew a really I knew a beautiful soul in San Jose, a blues player. You might have heard, you might have heard him, made it not. His name was Andy Mazzilli. He was a really good blues player. Huh. Uh, and uh, I mean, he used to hang out with me at, at Marsugi's in San Jose, and we sit there and talk for hours. You know, he'd come over and see different bands or whatnot. And then when I left, when I left California for Michigan, I left here in '99, and I was, you know, I was just, uh, you know, once in a while, I'd get a burr in my butt and I go over there and see what's going on in the, you know, in the, you know, in San Jose. And I was just stunned to find his, you know, his, his they had an obituary for him. And then I reached out to a couple of people and they said that he had overdosed. And I was just so heart sick because he wasn't like that when I knew him, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and I was just like, what, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I was like, I was heartbroken and I was mad. I was mad at him for doing that because he, he wasn't like that when I knew him. You know, he was it's like, what the hell did you do that for? You know, it's like, you know, you, it, well, you know, because you play blues and I guess blues and the heroin always seem to walk together. It was, it was, just, it was just stupidity. And I just, it just hurt. It just really hurt my feelings, you know, that, that he would throw away his gift like that. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, I mean, I did a lot of research about, why people become addicted to drugs and i mean to blame the 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 person i think is really is not the way to go because there's all these factors like like a big like a factor in someone becoming addicted later on in their life to drugs is if their family moves around a lot you know when they're a kid and um and that was the case with jimmy's family another factor can, you know, Jimmy was clinically depressed and he only found that was only diagnosed later in his life. But in fact, you know, he was told that he had probably been clinically depressed since he was a kid. Yeah. Um, so that's another factor, you yeah. know. And then another thing is basically addiction um, is kind of a learned behavior. And basically, Jimmy, because of, I think, because of having moved around as a kid and so then you can't ever depend on you make friends with somebody, but then you you move. And so there yeah. you're no longer, you know, you can't it's count on friends. You, can, you can't count on anything. And so, so there's that sort of thing about the whole uh, unstableness of, of your life when, you know, and then Jimmy, it was like a, you know, his, his dad was in the air force. It was a military family. Jimmy was the youngest kid. So his dad was, was one of these, you know, you know, you know, you be seen, but not heard, you know, it was like, like pretty, pretty tough in terms of how, how, you know, the kids, you know, the kids were, were raised. And um, 
So that was another factor, you know, am I, am I, you know, is, am I doing the right thing? You know, am, am I going to get in trouble? Is somebody, am I they going to get mad at me? You know, whatever. Um, and so, you know, there's just a variety of factors. And, and, and so Jimmy had a pain inside him and what he found out, you know, I mean, he started, you know, drinking and, and doing, you know, drugs, you know, when he was in high school. And I mean, what he found out was like, you know, this is a way I can, I can alleviate the pain for a while. When I'm when I'm high, I'm not feeling the pain that I'm feeling all the time otherwise. And and when he, you know, he he told a friend later the first time that he that he tried heroin, he said it was like coming home. It was like it just it, it was like the first time he really felt like sort of like himself, you know, like like he he didn't have to he, while he was high. He didn't. He wasn't dealing with any of that pain and any of that, you know, sadness and 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 all of that. And so, so basically, Jimmy learned. He learned that drugs were a way that he could escape. Yeah, you know, a lot of people the find pain, that out. You know, and and the, so the thing is, Jimmy never. He never got to the point where he. It was like he wanted. He never sort of hit bottom to the place where it's like. I want to stop. I want to stop, you know, using this stuff. If he had, if he had gotten to that point, then there's all kinds of ways that, you know, you know, things that can be done for the, to get the person off the drugs and, and clean. But if the person doesn't want to clean up, then it just, it just doesn't happen. And, and it's not, but you can't blame the person for that because, they're so under the sway of this of these drugs, and I, I just so, always felt for my so, friend. I just felt like he was under the sway of it. It was almost like it was like a requirement, you know. Because Jesus, I mean, I mean, honestly, I think of all the all, of all the music genres, the one I mean, when you start thinking about drug use, even more so than than rock and roll. I swear to God, in ten years, it was seemed like every time I I you know was blues was number one. Holy shit! They just all they just all had car crashes, and it was just like it was almost like it's part of the deal, it's part of the program, it's part of being a, a, a blues musician. You know, it's just like, but it doesn't have to be. Um, I, it's, it, you know, it's hard to say. You know, it's it's so it sucks for one thing. It's it really does suck. I mean, it's like, I mean, I I. I you know, I I don't drink or smoke, and I'm sure you don't either. And yeah. and, and and you know, and you know, we faced our own pressure. I got I got yelled at by a lot of musicians for not having a drink with them. They would sit there, don't you have a drink? No, I don't. I don't drink. Are Are you an alcoholic? I'm like, no, I just choose not to drink. I don't drink at all. I'm I'm straight edge. That's what I was sit there and say, straight <laughs> edge. I said, yeah. When in doubt, straight edge it, right? But a lot of them will really get pissed off that I, you wouldn't have a drink with them. It's like, but it's okay. It's okay that you don't. Um, and then they accept it, and then we move on. But, you know, I, I just sat there. I, sometimes I felt so outside of that world, even though I was in it. But I felt so outside of it because I didn't do any of those learned behaviors that you spoke about. I didn't, I didn't dabble. I didn't, I, I wasn't tempted. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to after parties. Uh, I didn't go on the bus or anything like that. You, my God, I'm sure you probably have more enough stories of people offering you shit than, than, than you could shake a stick at. But well, you just well said, I mean, you just... I mean, back in the, back in the day, I mean, you know, I would drink some alcohol. I mean, I wasn't like, I didn't, didn't drink. I mean, and, um, you know, and there, and I famously, uh, I was doing a story. For, uh, Rick James had, you know, his huge hit was Super Freak. Yeah. And and I had kind of become friends with Rick James before that because I mean, not really friends, but I had written about him a bunch of times before Super Freak happened. So when it happened, um, I mean he was comfortable with me hanging, hanging out and, and writing about him, you know, because I'd written these other stories and he, he thought the stories treated him fairly. And so, um, so 
now he's got super freak and I'm supposed to write this like, you know, 4,000 words, big story about Rick James. And so I'm going to spend like four days with him. So I'm supposed to meet him at the record plant in Sausalito. And then we're going to go to the airport. We're going to, we're going to fly to LA. I'm going to go with him to Motown. We're going to, you know, we're going to hang out and do stuff for four days. And um, so I get there and his guy says, uh, well, uh, Rick can't see you right now because and Rick has been living at the record plant for months while he completed his follow-up album to Super Freak or, or to, to, to the, I'm sorry, to Street Songs, which was the album Super Freak was on. Um, and so his guy says, you know, Rick's really sorry, but he can't see you right now because he's with Sly Stone and him and Sly Stone are in the in the bedroom where that was 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 Rick's room for for these this period of months, and so I didn't know this, but they were freebasing. Yeah, in there. I remember that. So I'm sitting I'm sitting um, in the hallway basically at the record plant, and you know, an hour goes by, another hour goes by. At a certain point, Rick's guy comes over with a little baggie of powder, white powder, and says, Rick feels really bad, Michael, um, but he's still hanging out with Sly, so um, he thought maybe you'd like this. So so I ha he gives me this little bag of cocaine. So I used some of that cocaine. I didn't, didn't like not use it. And, uh, you know, that was, just, the, that was just, that was just the, 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 way it, the way it went, you know. Sure, and. Sure. Um, and I, and I and I famously had did this story. I did this story on on Huey Lewis, and um, this wasn't later. I did a cover story on him, but this was this was earlier on, and and basically, um, we went out. We went to this bar, and and basically, my idea sort of was that I'm thinking, well, if I can get Huey Lewis really really drunk, then I can sort of get him to admit that he's kind of sold out in terms of this song that's a big hit for him for him now and um and so that's what i did and so you know, basically i'm sort of i mean i'm trying not to drink as much as he as, as he was drinking during that particular time but i still ended up you know drinking quite a bit um but i did get the story <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah our, it was, it was crazy. Our, our friend emotions here he's a singer songwriter uh, and he was on the show a few uh, uh, a few episodes back, but he came in and he's saying hello to you. Um, Michael Goldberg is a uh, he is a writer who has uh, written so many things, including a new book uh, detailing the, the the life of uh, James Calvin Wilsey, who played in the Avengers and Silvertone. Chris Isaac. Uh, he put out a record in 2008 called El Dorado. I put the single out. On the in the chat, it's on the tube. So I, I dropped a single on the chat. Uh, if you want to see what uh, uh see how good James really was, that's a great uh that's a great record to, to listen to. Um, did, did, you know what was the last time you saw James as you know as you know like you know where he was because he said that he was homeless at the time that he that he, that he got sick. Yeah, I mean, well, what happened was to him. It's really a sad situation. Um, he he moved up to he, he had been living in L.A. and he got this um, this new girlfriend who lived in the Bay Area, and so he moved up to the Bay Area and moved into her house. And then and this is he's he's had a liver transplant a couple of years earlier, mm -hmm. and he's taken drugs for the you know to. To keep the liver from you know for the body rejecting the liver but he starts he starts using um you know and um and so at a certain point she says you got to go she wasn't going to put up with um having you know a drug addict in her house and so um so basically he went to arizona where his sisters live and um and he he got checked into a, a rehab facility there and um, and supposedly got kind of cleaned up. And then he um, then he went back to LA 
And he moved in. He had gotten divorced from his wife, but he, she was living at a at a two story house in in Eagle Rock, which is in Los Angeles, an area of Los Angeles. And so, he moved in to the house. Now they were no longer a couple. They were no longer lovers, or you know, he just moved in as a friend at that point. And uh, and there were other people living in that house. And that house, it was it was a pretty druggy scene in that in that house. And uh, and so after he, he lived there for about a year and then they got evicted. And so Jimmy started living in his car. And he did apparently he had like spent all, all the money that he had. He wasn't working anymore. So he would get royalties, you know, he would c continue to get some royalties from the Chris Isaac stuff, but it wasn't a lot of money and he'd burn through it fast. And um, so, you know, there he was and he moved into, you know, he's, he's living in his car. And then after a while, he's sleeping on a piece of cardboard on this sort of narrow, um, narrow uh, little walkway that's between a building and some shrubs that this um, this woman, Ivana Manley, who was actually, she owned a company that made high-end audio gear. So she owns this building and Jimmy is sleeping on this walkway there. And so she discovers him sleeping there. She doesn't know it's Jimmy Wilsey. She doesn't know who he is, just like some bum who's like sleeping in you know, a homeless person. So she says, hey, man, you, you, you got to go. You cannot sleep on my property. You got to go somewhere else. And so she said she was really surprised because most of the time, if there were homeless people on her property, because there was a whole homeless encampment just a couple of blocks away from her place underneath the, the 134 freeway. And so, uh, but she said most of the time they would just split and they'd leave whatever mess they'd made on her property and she'd have to clean it all up and there'd be needles and all that. Yeah. She said Jimmy cleaned up after himself and then he left. Well, then another day, she finds him there again, sleeping in the same place. Well, he looks at her and he says, you're, you're Ivana Manley, right? You know, gear slut. Now gear slut, it was a, um, an online forum for, for people who are into high, high end audio. It was like a forum and it was called gear slut. And now it's called gear space. But anyway, that was one of the forums, online forums where Jimmy, would hang out and she hung out there sometimes. And so he knew her from there. So when he says to her, he says, you know, gear slut. And he also mentions this piece of audio equipment that her company made. She is just like, what, how, how is it that this homeless bum knows about gear slut? That doesn't make any sense. So she says, who are you? He says, uh, Jimmy Wilsey. She she doesn't know who that is, but she looks him up on Google later that day and she finds out that he used to play guitar with Chris Isaac and she's good friends with the, the guy who engineered a lot of the Chris Isaac records. So she calls him up and she says, hey, I don't know if you, you know about this, but, you know, this guy, Jimmy Wilsey, who used to play with Chris Isaac, he's like homeless. He's like camping out on my property. And uh, and the guy goes like, oh, no, he's at it again. You know, like like this was an old story and which it was, of course. So after that, she let Jimmy continue to sleep, you know, on her walkway and she would bring out some food to him. Sometimes she would give him some tea. But at the same time, she knew he was an addict and she didn't or he was addicted to, to drugs. She knew that. And so she was wary, you know, because she knew from experience that, you know, I mean, someone who's a drug addict, they'll do whatever they need to get drugs, you know. And so, so she sort of kept at arm's length. But that was basically where Jimmy spent the last month or so of his life, you know, and a uh, couple of months of his life, actually. And, um, and then at a certain point, he, uh, you know, she, she said he wasn't looking. He was looking really bad and he was just lying there. And so she said, Jimmy, are you all right? And he said, no. He said, actually, could you call an ambulance and take, you know, I need to go to a hospital. And so the ambulance took him to, to a hospital and he fell into a coma 
And then uh, a number of days later, uh, he died of organ failure. Uh, it's really, you know, a really, really sad thing. Um, mm -hmm. Thing is that that he was in this coma, and some of his friends and some of his family were in the room with him. And one of one of the people there, Jimmy's in this coma, right? He holds up his iPhone to Jimmy's ear and plays Wicked Game. Which you know, Jimmy plays the he wrote the 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 opening introduction and all the electric guitar parts for that song, and so those notes start playing, and and then Jimmy they said Jimmy smiled when that played. It was the first time that he reacted to anything in the time that they had been with him, and uh, you know, and then he he died at at about four o'clock in the afternoon, four twenty in the afternoon, on mm -hmm. Christmas Eve day, uh, you know. Very sad, but um, but also, um, I don't what, know. When's when, when the last time you actually saw him face to face? Oh, I I hadn't seen him for years. I mean, I mm -hmm. I didn't see him after when when he started disappearing. You know, I mean, basically you couldn't get a hold of him and stuff back in '92. At a certain point, I mean, I had a lot going on in my life, so. I couldn't, it wasn't like all I was doing was hanging out with Jimmy Wilsey. I mean, I was working for Rolling Stone. I was reporting stories. I was, I was doing a lot, a lot of stuff in those days. And um, mm -hmm. so, you know, and so, um, so basically it was like, you know, God, this is just so, this is a big drag that Jimmy, that Jimmy's just like not accessible anymore. But at a certain point, I just had to like, kind of like walk away. And the thing was that years later, in 1998, I got wind of the fact that um, that Jimmy was had a new band. He had a band in L.A. called the Mysteries, an instrumental band. And at that point, I was the um, I was the um, the editor in chief of um, a couple of online magazines. One called SonicNet, and also a magazine that I started called Addicted to Noise. I had sold Addicted to Noise to the company that owned SonicNet, and so I was the editor in chief of this combined entity. And so, when I heard that Jimmy had a new band, I immediately assigned one of my writers to do a story about Jimmy's new band, The Mysteries. And I also got on the phone with Jimmy, and we talked, and he he sounded good, and he told me that he was. Um, told me that he um, was doing um, tech stuff um, and that he was, um, I guess at that point, he got the mysteries going. I don't know if he was doing the tech stuff right then, but he told me about this band. And I said, well, I've got this great reporter who's in LA and she'll come and she'll interview you and she'll, she'll review the show. She'll write a story about your band, you know? And uh, so Jimmy, of course, was, you know, he dug that. And so I, uh, that happened. And, and if you can find those stories, I mean, if you do a search for the mysteries um, and uh, you'll, those stories will come up, they're on MTV um, online now because MTV ultimately bought the company that owned, uh, owned Sonic net and owned addicted to noise. But, um, but anyway, then a few years later, I mean, 2008, Jimmy put out El Dorado. And I talked to him on the phone then too, and uh, and he sent sent me up a copy of El Dorado, and I listened to it, and I we did something on El Dorado uh, at that point, uh, but he was in L.A. and I was up in San Francisco, so you know it wasn't like he was coming up here or or I was really going down there. Uh, so then a whole bunch of time went by, and then the last time I had contact with Jimmy was in uh, June of two well. In June of 2018, I was working on a story on the lasting impact of the Mabue Gardens. And so I thought it'd be great to get Jimmy on the phone to talk a little bit about why, you know, the Mabue Gardens and what was important about it. And, you know, because he'd been there. He'd lived there practically for, for a couple of years. And so, um, so I sent him a Facebook message and he, I get back this um smiley face emoji but that's it i don't i don't get back any other response and i i so i sent him another message saying jimmy i mean i've only got a couple of days left here before this with this story but um you know if i can get you on the phone i could get a couple of quotes from you into the story it'd be cool man and i don't hear anything from him 
And uh-huh. then in September, I get a message from him. And it's this sort of vague, weird thing. It's like, I lost my phone. I didn't have a phone. I couldn't, you know, didn't make any sense, you know. But and I thought, uh-huh. oh, oh, man, this guy's got to be, he's got to be on drugs again, you know. Uh-huh. And, and, um, and then that was it. That was the last contact that I, that I had with him. That was, that was like, you know, September. And then he died in, in, you know, Christmas Eve day. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now I, I noticed that, you know, you know, I, I had asked you when we first started talking, you know, like, if you know, if Penelope had helped, you know, had given her okay on this and everything else. What was the reaction you got from everybody who, and I won't keep you too much longer. Um, but we, you, you will come back though, right? You, you What's that? Back? Oh, you, sure. You will... Yeah, oh. sure. Yeah. Wow. Mind blown. Okay. Uh, 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 you did. I was wanted to. Uh, I was going to ask you because uh, you mentioned you talked to Penelope and whatnot. Uh, what kind of what kind of help did you get doing the book? Were people were people did they were they eager to help you or did, did you know were they were they as, as passionate about uh, uh, Jimmy as you were or had you know had too much time gone by or no, I talked to um, I talked to over sixty people who were either friends of Jimmy's, musicians who had worked with Jimmy, people in the music business who had worked with Jimmy, uh, you know, uh, people who are really good friends with Jimmy at different points in his life. Uh, I talked to you know, his sisters and his one of his nieces, uh, you know, his his best friend in junior high school. His good friends of his in high school. You know, I mean, I, I talked to a lot of people and with some of these people, I talked to them over and over again, over the three years. I mean, I don't know how many hours I, I spent talking to Eric Jacobson, um, you know, the producer, you know, and, and, you know, uh, manager of, of Silvertone and, and of Chris Isaac, uh, talked to, you know, him just hours and hours and hours and, and other people too, you know, and and there were people where I would email people off and on over you know two three years every time a because uh, as I was working on the book new questions would come up and so then I would go back to the right to the person who was the the, the particular person who I thought could address that particular question that I had and um, and everyone I talked to uh, was into it I mean they wanted to talk about about Jimmy. Uh, and they, you know, they liked the idea that I was writing a book about Jimmy and they felt like, um, they had read the stories that I had written about him after he died. They knew that I had been friends with him. They knew I had written about Silvertone for Rolling Stone and Jimmy uh, profiled Jimmy for guitar player. So, I mean, they, they seemed to feel comfortable, um, you know, talking to me. There were a few people that it took a little while before they decided they wanted to talk. But but then they did, um, and, was this, was and, this and one of those people, or and, wait, hold on a second. and then um, I mean Penelope, I was like one of the first people I talked to. I mean I talked to when I was doing my Rolling Stone story, I think I talked to Eric Jacobson first, maybe Mark Plummer who had co-managed the band, and then and then Penelope, uh, and um, and then over the three years, periodically I would email questions to Penelope. Um, and then she would re- would respond. She was, she was really great. Um, and what was I gonna? What else was I gonna say? Um, you know, I had also I had interviewed Jimmy for over four hours back in in sort of the heyday of Silvertone. I mean, I interviewed him once in '87 and once in '91. I had interviewed Chris Isaac for over ten hours, spread out over ten years. I've done many interviews with him, and I had all those interviews on tape. So. Um, so I had a, and, and I had interviewed Eric Jacobson back in those days as well, and as well as Mark Plummer. So um, I had stuff with them talking about things when it was really fresh, you know, not like they're trying to remember back 40 years. It's like they're just remembering back two years or three years or something. So, you know, I had all that stuff on tape and, um, you know, but then I like I say, I did did all these interviews um, and then I also got access to the last interview that Jimmy did, which was a three hour interview he did in July of 2018. And um, yeah, so um, but yeah, people people were into it and I've gotten really positive responses from people. I mean, um, sure. to the 
to the book and people who, um, you know, who people who I interviewed for the book and 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 then lots of people who just um, who who bought the book, you know, because they because they cared about Jimmy and who have who have read it and they you know they feel like it's a very moving book and people have have ta- told me that you know they started crying reading the first chapter because the first chapter is a very it's a very heavy chapter um but um but they also said you know i i really feel like you've done justice to jimmy's life here and his life was a tragedy and um you captured that but you also captured why he was why he was important and, and what it was about his guitar playing and and you know and what he was like and and all of that so uh it's something yeah. else isn't it when someone like that really stays with you you know you know they stay with you really close you know um you know i remember when mia zapata got killed do you remember her from the gets yeah, yeah. i mean she played that i had her last i had the get i had the gets last show oh, wow. before they went home as wow. a band and she did an acoustic set for a friend and then they went home and then she was killed. And I remember, I remember hearing about that and they couldn't, they didn't find the killer, you know, for 10 years, they didn't find him until they, you know, some cop working the cold case, you know, found, found the guy. But I mean, for eight years, it's just, you know, for 10 years, I was just so haunting and, you know, and I put on a gets record and it's just like, it moves me, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's punk rock and it's glorious and it's amazing and it's beautiful and it's and it pisses me off that someone would take that out of this world, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would have it was this the hardest loss you experienced in your career as far as being a music writer? Was that was it um yeah, it was because of the fact of I mean, it was so unexpected. I mean, I just I just had in my mind this idea, even though I'd had this sort of weird experience with Jimmy and back in, you know, June and September, it didn't really click that he was still using drugs. I mean, I thought something's kind of weird, but, but that hadn't clicked. And so when, when I, when I went on to Facebook and when I went, you know, saw that, that post that Jimmy had died the day before, I, I really was shocked, you know, and it just, I just couldn't imagine it. I just, it's, yeah. I, it just, it just didn't, it just didn't make sense. Now, I didn't know about the liver transplant. I did, I just didn't know a lot of things that, as when I researched the book and and all, and you know, started talking to people, you know, um, then I, you know, then it's then it made then it all made sense. But it didn't make sense at that point. Other people who had, who had, you know, I mean, Jimmy didn't OD. You know, Jimmy. No. I mean, it's the drugs and the drugs and alcohol and everything that he used for so many years led, led, led to let you know set him up for the organ failures that you know caused him to die but it wasn't like he actually od that's that's not not what happened but um other and people you know, i mean i mean know, like and that's important to know i think it's important to, to i think it's important to say that to say that when he died he probably most likely was dying to sober, you know, I'm sure he, you know, I'm, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it caught up to him and, you know, he probably didn't have the money, the care to take the anti, the anti rejection medications that he would have needed for his liver. I'm sure that played into it big time. No, know? he didn't. He, he didn't want, he, st- it wasn't like that. I mean, he was just not, he didn't take it seriously. He sort of, he had, he apparently had an expectation that, when he after he had the liver transplant, it was going to be like he, he was all all new again. It was starting over, and it and it's not and, it, it, and it's not like that, you know. Mm-hmm. And he didn't he didn't like taking the drugs, and he he didn't no. you know he he didn't take the drug you know. But but and you know anyway. But um, there were other people you know through the years. I mean, like I I really like this band Flipper, and Flipper are still together. But one of the key members of Flipper was a guy named Will Shatter, and Will Shatter OD'd. But, yep. but by the time he OD'd, I was pretty distanced from, I mean, I had, I had interviewed and written about Flipper back in like the early eighties and, you know, he, he OD'd many years after that. And so, well, I, think so, he, I so, think he OD'd in the nineties, right? So, so I believe so. And it didn't. And so that, you know, it was like, well, that's a drag, but it didn't hit me like this. And, you know, I knew the guys in, in crime. 
you know, the San Francisco punk band. And, you know, and the, and those guys, and, you know, ended up, you know, they had problems with drugs and they, they ended up dying. And, um, but again, it, it wasn't, you know, I mean, it, it just wasn't the same same situation. Um, I mean, it it hit me, you know, when John Lennon died, and I didn't know John Lennon. I never talked to John Lennon. I just I just related to John Lennon's music, like millions and millions of people, hundreds of millions of people all over the world. That was something that that hit me really hard, you know. Um, but in terms of somebody that I actually knew, um, yeah, I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy, it was that that was a big deal, you know. Um, well. Yeah. Uh, where can where can uh, where can we uh, get the book at now? Um, well, yeah, the best place to get the book is to order it through the publisher. The publisher is Hozak. Basically, you 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 if you Google Hozak Records and Books, um, you'll come up to their homepage. And right now, the the book is right on the homepage. And you know, as time goes by, if it's not on the homepage, if you just go there and then just go to books, you'll find it. And the reason if that's the best place to get it is because first of all, it's the cheapest place to get it. And second of all, if you if the book is bought directly from the publisher, that means he and I'm donating 25% of all my royalties from this book to Jimmy's teenage son Waylon. And so oh. and so um Waylon and myself and the independent publisher who published the book we make the most money for each book sold if someone buys directly from the publisher. And the reason for that, you know, people may not always know, but you know, if the book, if you get the book at a bookstore, I mean, they're going to take half, you know, just off the top, you know, and if you order it from Amazon, they're going to take a big chunk of it. And so, um, so this is, this is like the best way to get it from, from our perspective. And I think it's the best way for, for someone who wants to read the book to get it. Because uh, it is that's the cheapest place that you can you can get it is directly from the publisher, Hozak Records and Books. Yeah. I, I will definitely put all the information down. I'll put all the I'll get I'll, you know I'll ask you what information you want me to put. I'll put that down in the description box down below. Um, I've already kept you really past my, uh, past time. I really am grateful for this talk. Uh, I, I have well, so many more questions. Uh, there's there's two other things that I do want to say if I can. One is. Sure. If, if you happen to live in the Bay Area, I'm going to be doing a reading at the Beat Museum in San Francisco at 7 p.m. on uh, Saturday, June 18. And so, uh, if you're in San Francisco or you're 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 in the vicinity, uh, it, it'll be it'll be a cool event. And I'll be playing uh, music, Jimmy's music, for between six and seven. I'll be paying recording, some of them pretty obscure. Uh, of Jimmy's music, and then at seven, I'll I'll be doing some reading from the book, and then I'll be taking questions and stuff. Um, and then the other thing is, um, on July twenty first, I'll be doing an online uh, conversation with the bookstore Book Passage, uh, which is a Bay Area uh, bookstore. But it'll be an online event, and the former Cream Magazine managing editor Robert Duncan is going to um, interview me as part of this book passage event. So, um, so again, and that's something you could be anywhere in the world and you could check it out. And, uh, and that'll be, that'll be a pretty cool thing. So anyway, I'll put that in the description box too. And so, uh, cool. uh so hopefully that, hopefully they won't take it, you know, hopefully they'll do what we're doing here is, uh, they'll just leave it up, you know, so pe people can't make the event. They can go back and watch the replay. Yeah. People, they people, will. People, yeah. yeah. Okay, they good. Will. They will. So, yeah. Uh, listen, uh, Michael, I, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, I'm like I said, I'm totally blown away that you you asked me to interview you. I'm I'm just honored. I mean, it's like, you know, so this is like a grail guest here uh, for me. You know, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank oh, you. gosh. I mean, I mean, 10 years. I mean, you know, your career and I mean, you know, the slight touch, you know, the slight connections. It's, it's really cool. And it's like, you know, I'm very sorry for what happened to James. I do like the idea that you wrote the book both as a tribute and as a cautionary tale, you know, it's, yeah. you have to do that. You have to be honest to do that. And so, um, but we still got his music. We still got his music. Anytime you hear Wiffy game or I dropped the Eldorado link into the chat. Cool. Um, that's an amazing piece. God, I want to go and listen to that record. 
I did not know he released that record. I definitely wanted to listen to it. That's an amazing piece. Yeah, there's um, also also some great videos, live videos of him on YouTube, um, and of playing that music from that album, and uh, it's worth seeking out. And also some songs that aren't on the album, some covers that he does that are beautiful, just beautiful. I mean, he does a cover of Santo and Johnny's Sleepwalk that is just exquisite. Uh, yeah, you can find that stuff on YouTube. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, well, hopefully you'll have me back. I, you know, I have this collection uh, coming out um, in November. It's called Addicted to Noise, the music writings of Michael Goldberg. And uh, so may maybe we can, you know, we can do one of these and we can talk about because because that's that's a whole different thing. That's uh, yeah. That's I, I, you know. I'll make it yeah. a little, I'm already going to write that down and uh, have you come back for that. I'll I'll, I'll I'll stay in touch, obviously, and then when we get closer to the date, uh, we'll have you come back and uh, and regale some some more stories. Cool. Um, Great. I thanks. can't wait. Uh, thank you guys in the chat. You guys have been outstanding as always. Um, I, I'm so thankful for you guys. You guys really make this uh, a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for staying for the whole show. I really do appreciate that. Uh, it helps the channel out greatly. If you're new to my channel, feel free to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and drop a comment down below. I really like to get some comments from you guys in the chat tonight. I really want to, I want to hear what you think about, uh, about tonight's discussion. Um, I will drop all your information down in the description box down below. And tomorrow night, we will be back here at 8 o'clock, and we'll be talking to film director and uh, editor Sean Kane at 8, 8 p.m. Uh, Michael, it's been an honor and a pleasure, and we will talk at you soon. Great. Thanks uh, a lot. Right, yep, stay right where you're at for one minute. Okay.